30 seconds. everyone. Uh, it is now 10 o'clock on May the 27th, and I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order our budget work session. Uh, and I want to welcome everyone here today. I want to thank our, I want to thank our staff, our budget staff for all the amazing work they've done to get us to this point. And uh, Bertha, I really want to thank you and your team, as well as our finance folks and <laughs> Deputy City Manager Page, um, plus everyone who is here. Um, can can everybody mute? Thanks. Um, and also our tech staff, uh, everybody from Technology Solutions, everyone from our clerk's office, everyone from our office, our office for Public Affairs, uh, who all work together to make these online meetings happen uh, and we're very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Um, and now Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Certainly. Good morning, everyone. Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Caballero. Here. Council Member Freeman. Present. Council Member Middleton. Here. Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, Madam Clerk. And now I'm going to turn this over to uh, City Manager Tom Bonfield, and uh, he will uh, direct us about how we want to go through these presentations. Mr. Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, the time you've carved out for us and these uh, this first of uh, two abbreviated uh, budget work sessions. Uh, as I indicated, uh, when I presented the budget a uh, week before last, uh, this uh, budget process, obviously, as we all know, has been unique, uh, but it has been very fluid. Uh, even since the, uh, the initial budget presentation, uh, there are a number of additional items that have changed that you will hear about today. N not many, but a few that are very important. Uh, also, I want to say that, uh, you know, you're very much used to uh, the, the formats that we've tried to uh, uh, use in budget pass with uh, hitting uh, much of the, the budget documents, performance measures, and those kinds of things. But as I'm sure you've seen, if you've reviewed the uh, the materials that we've uh, sent to you, and I would say too, thank you for your patience in getting those. I wouldn't, not necessarily last minute, but uh, uh, toward the end of the process, uh, as I said, those have been fluid and uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, when they were presented today, they had, they were as current as the information we had. But we really tried to uh, to highlight and balance the uh, the aspects of uh, of the budget going forward in terms of the the more traditional kinds of uh, things with the uh, the resource allocation tables and some of the things you've used to see, but really a lot more input on uh, kind of updating you on the the impact of uh, COVID-19 on budget, both the current year budget, operational decisions that we have made in the current year. Uh, but also uh, how it will impact the uh, the budget that you'll be considering over the next several weeks, as well as many of the operational impacts that uh, that we have built into that, that budget. So uh, this really is kind of a hybrid approach, in my opinion, of, of thinking about it in terms of the, the budget and the appropriations and those kinds of things, but also uh, hopefully as we uh, go through the next couple of days, we can talk about some of these operational aspects uh, and answer any questions you have as well. So with that, I am going to uh, uh, turn it over to Bertha and uh, let her begin the process. You've seen the agenda and uh, hopefully that is a sequence that is okay over the next couple of days. Uh, we've carved out uh, 
the goal of three hours, but uh, the uh, the Zoom uh, uh, allotment is four hours in the event we extend over. Uh, but I think that uh, we we are I know we're prepared to uh, to engage you and hopefully uh, answer any questions you have as you consider the budget. So thank you for your time today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bertha. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. I do want to bring up the agenda just for the viewing public um, to go over what we're going to discuss in the meeting today. Um, I also want to remind everyone that all of the presentations on the schedule are on our webpage as well as the budget book, which we just uh, finished uh, yesterday. So again, one of those delays in trying to work together and pour together uh, budget pages for 25 departments um, and all the, the multi-year funds and with the numbers changing as, as uh, the city manager mentioned. So today uh, we will have a revenue presentation. We'll talk about pay and benefits, general services, parks and recreation and transportation. Those are mostly related to updating on programmatic changes as it relates to COVID-19, as well as uh, some questions we receive from council they will be responding to in their presentations. Tomorrow, we start at the same time at 10, and we will have uh, city county planning, public works, community development, um, Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and we'll have a discussion at the end around engagement. Um, as you hear from uh, several of the departments listed here, they have engagement components um, in their work. And so you'll hear some of that and we wanted to hold that discussion to the end so we can talk about engagement um, as an organization versus individual departments and uh, get some solicit some feedback from you all. So um, if there are no questions about the agenda, no additions to the agenda, we will move to the revenue presentation. So uh, while John Allure is pulling up the revenue presentation, um, I wanted to say about this presentation, um, it's, a, it's a lengthy presentation and I'll go through it uh, quickly because um, this is the same template we use each year for the revenue presentation, but we've had several meetings with you. And so a lot of this information um, is the same information we've shared with you. You've also heard a lot in the manager's presentation. So I'll go through some of it uh, quickly um, and especially since you haven't had an opportunity to hear from the departments that we'll be presenting later, I want to make sure that we have adequate time for those discussions. So if you feel like I'm uh, going quickly, just, just let me know. So we'll start out by uh, talking about the key issues which are, are not new to you. Um, the revenue losses that we are projecting uh, around property tax, sales tax, uh, power bill, gas tax, hotel tax and some program revenues. Um, also no tax rate increase uh, as we had discussed early in the year and an extremely significant uh, use of fund balance more than we've used in a, in a really long time, probably uh, most recently back to 2009, uh, 10. Here's um, a slide that's really uh, key to the presentation and probably most of the focus is that uh, just to be clear about what revenue loss is when we say revenue loss what we mean and we're really focused on we had um, projected uh, we had EOI projections which is the second second column here and pre-COVID in the pre-COVID projection of those projections we shared with you at the budget retreat on February 14th and so when we talk about losses, we're really talking about what we, where we thought we were going to be in terms of revenues to support our budget to where we are now in the proposed budget. One um, line item has changed since the manager presented his budget. That is power bill. Uh, we shared with you when we met last uh, time um, at the special meeting and at the update that we probably would be updating that power bill number. Uh, the mayor has shared with you all as well that uh, you know, he'd heard the 25% reduction. We've since uh, confirmed that um, through meetings that not only we've had with, um, with the league, but also our transportation department with their peers, as well as some, uh, some uh, folks at uh, NCDOT. So we have now uh, recognized that 25% loss um, in the budget, and we'll, we'll talk about how we, we were able to do that as we move through the presentation. But that's the only number that's changed here since we met last time. 
So moving on to our just an overlook of our uh, overview of our general fund revenue summary. And this is just to uh, comparison from year to year, uh, looking at the major revenue sources in the general fund. We primarily focus on property tax and sales tax because those are the primary sources. And when we talk about a budget deficit or gap or where we can um, find additional revenue, those are the really only uh, sufficient sources. And the only one that we really have control over is property tax and we're not proposing a rate increase. And so um, there is not a lot of additional revenue there to balance the budget. So Arthur, can I ask a question? Sure. Or would you would you like me to hold it to the end? You you can answer that. You can ask now. Thank you. This slide, the property tax for FY 2021, the far right column, looks to me like a different number than on the previous slide, and I wasn't sure if they were supposed to be different from some reason or if that just had not been updated. Uh, good question. Uh, those are supposed to be different. The property tax number here includes prior year levies, uh, de uh, delinquent taxes, penalties. It's the total tax revenue. The other one is just the current year levy. Got you. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Just looking at the makeup of uh, the general fund uh, revenues, again, just another way of showing you um, how dependent the general fund is on property taxes and uh, other local taxes, which is, of course, our sales tax and our hotel motel tax. So when we think again about how do we generate additional revenue, there's no other place really to go um, except the property tax. We are again proposing the rate, property tax rate to remain the same. Uh, we talked about uh, property tax rate increase in February. Uh, this council decided and we recommended that we not do this at this time and so therefore the rate will remain the same uh, for for uh, we had some comments um, I think from the general public in terms of uh, people calculating their their property tax rate and um, really what they had done when they said our, our numbers were not correct is that they were not separating out the city tax from the county tax and so when the manager presented the the uh, budget and, and people calculate their, their tax bill, um, I just want folks to know that that is, uh, you need to separate out the city and county when you try to do that. Property tax uh, base growth. Um, this is uh, the chart that we typically include. It's also included in our budget book. Um, just uh, one thing I want to point out here, if you look at our, our motor vehicle tax, we talked about that being projected to remain flat. Um, that is a rec recommendation from the uh, tax office in terms of what they're seeing with um, people uh, uh, the, uh, relinquishing their vehicles as well as not purchasing vehicles. Property tax uh, projections. Again, looking at um, what is the, the assessed value here and the other slides were really focused on the revenue, but assessed value growth, which is really driven uh, by the real property, which is uh, the majority of that growth. So the overall growth is 2.31%. Um, the second kind of section of the slide shows um, the rate breakout, which you saw on the previous slide. Um, and one thing I wanna point out here when we talk about the loss, um, in revenue from pre-COVID to now, we had intended to raise our collection rate uh, because of the great uh, job that the county is doing in collections to 99%. But based on the update, uh, we, uh, we allowed that rate, that percentage to remain at 99.6. So that was the million dollar loss from February to what we're paying now. Um, again, we, we didn't change the numbers other than uh, hold the collection rate uh, flat versus uh, changing it to 99%, which we had intended to do in February. And at the bottom of the slide, you just see the revenue allocation. So just another look at the property tax uh, rate allocation, but what is new in this slide is the second row from the bottom shows the tax collection fee, and then you get the net amount that the, each of the funds uh, listed here will gain um, in the next fiscal year, the total collections. Budget to, to actual, uh, so the blue line represent the, represents the budget, 
the red line actual, and then our end of year projection, which is what EOI is. So the blue line is just what we have in the uh, budgeted in the 21 budget. Sales tax collections, uh, we haven't changed this from when we met uh, last time. Also, uh, this num the numbers haven't changed from uh, what you saw in the manager's uh, budget. Um, the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, note here is probably um, the, one of the, relates to one of the questions we were asked at the last meeting about the additional revenue from uh, the sales tax agreement with the county. Uh, just again, we expect to get an additional 2.4 million. Uh, that number, those dollars are included in the budget to balance the budget. Um, sales tax is one of those revenues that we usually can depend on uh, getting a, a big chunk of additional revenues and that's not gonna happen uh, next year. And so that is the, that is the biggest uh, drain on the general fund and, uh, on the revenue side. Again, to that point, if you look at the blue um, 1819, the blue 1920, and the blue 2021, you can see the reduction um, of 6.6% uh, for sales tax. Um, that number went down in 2009-10 significantly. You know, it, it rebounded, and, you know, we expect that to happen again in the future, but for next year, uh, that number is projected to be significantly uh, lower. Uh, we hope that it's better but we will not find out for a while since we do not get our first uh, sales tax payment for next year until October. And so we're doing our best to try to make the best of the information that we have and make the best projections we can at this point. Look at the other uh, general fund uh, revenues, uh, pointing out here, uh, looking at the power bill number, that's the number that we updated since the manager's presentation. Um, that added about 1.5 million to our our budget um, gap, and so, uh, but we felt uh, confident, as the manager said, we, we held out as long as possible because we don't want to, uh, we want to be as best we can with the numbers to uh, make that change. So going to our fund balance slide, um, the only thing that's changed on this from when you saw it last is that we, we did increase the revenue loss due to COVID which was what was in the budget guidelines that we would use fund balance to uh, supplant revenue losses. Uh, we've added the 1.5 million. And so that number is 8.7 million. Uh, the decision to use fund balance for the 1.5 million primarily is one, it's a, it's a big number. And the other option would be, be to go to personal services because that's where the majority of our, of our expenditures are. But also when you use fund balance, um, there is no harm in terms of if you don't have the revenue loss, the money just stays in savings. So you're not making significant programmatic changes. And then to find out that these projections that we're making and you know we made in April and May, we won't know really until October, our first payment with sales tax, really the first quarter we'd need to see. So that'd be October, November, December and property tax is not collected until primarily December, January. So there's a long time before we'll know how good these uh, projections are. And they're in line with our peer cities, as well as the recommendations we're getting from the state. And so we feel, feel confident, but we don't know. And so we feel like the, the best option is to um, put in fund balance as a placeholder if the revenues come in as we projected. Bertha, let me jump in here a second too. I, you know, this is one of those, uh, uh, you know, swallow hearts for for all of us because it's so out of character as to how we have uh, uh, typically gone about the budget. Um, this is an area that I really feel like, um, you know, we're kind of at the at the end of options around fund balance, uh, particularly if things uh, as we progress through the year, uh, our our rev the revenue projections are worse than expected. Uh, I think we are going to be very challenged to uh, to uh, dig deeper into fund balance, uh, not because the, there may not be some money there between the 16.3% and the 12%, but because that is just building a huge challenge for the following year's budget. And uh, one of the things that you, uh, we're going to have to give some some serious thought to 
uh, as we begin the fiscal year uh, is uh, to begin to even you know prepare for other modifications to the budget should as as birth indicate when we start getting into October and seeing uh, you know sales tax numbers or or even later into uh, December with the property tax numbers if if uh, those numbers are you know are lower than we are projecting here uh, we're going to need to have a plan in place for uh, for reacting to that rather than waiting till December and then developing that plan so that is something that uh, that's on my mind. I know it's on Bertha's mind. We don't have a strategy about that. If anybody wants to know what's the plan, I think I'll be honest to say we don't have one right now. But uh, we also know that uh, you know we really can't wait until probably December to start thinking about that uh, when some of these significant milestones of, uh, of revenue collections uh, come forward. So I don't know, Bertha, if you have any other thing to follow up on that, but I just really want to emphasize that uh, you know the use of the fund balance here the 8.7 million is really heading into a, a any any more than that i think you know would potentially be very problematic as we think about what has to be made up in following years if that money is in fact needed this year thank you thank you um i think that those are important points to um for us to reiterate because we don't know what's going to happen and i don't want folks to we don't know any more than anyone else knows and so we're all making the making the best uh, projections but we are concerned that you know it could it could be even worse than than we anticipate so just a, a summary uh, of the multi-year the general fund multi-year um, what has changed here if you look in the 21 column under revenues and additional revenues we've added the 1.5 million that is the fund balance number um primarily and so that is that balances the budget we removed it from uh, power bill uh, reduced that by 25 percent 1.5 million and increased our fund balance to keep the budget balance bertha could you go back could you go back to that slide a minute uh go down to the uh, 2021 additional revenues i think this is a question that council member middleton had asked about at the uh, the budget work session uh I believe in that that eight million dollar number that includes uh, the revenues from the uh, the proceeds of the the Chapel Hill Street sales. Is that correct? No, it's it does not. not. It does okay. not. So can, so so we just need to clarify. At this point, then there is no revenue built into this model for the sale of the Chapel Hill Street property. That is correct. Okay. There's and no so, revenue. There's no budget for that. Okay, um, so I want to be clear, be real clear and, about that. So what that means is that when that happens, and I do believe it's still going to happen, the flow of funds, because it's a sale of a public property, will roll through the general fund. But then what the council does with those funds in terms of other appropriations will still be, uh, you know, your your determination whether that money is is needed in the general fund because of other other aspects of things like we just talked about, or if you determine that it's not needed here and it's more appropriate to transition to, you know, the affordable housing uh, component, uh, that still is an option, an opportunity you would have either through the, you know, through this, um, you know, during the budget year or or subsequent uh, subsequent budgets. And I, I just wanted to pause there and see if anybody had any questions and be sure that. I'm on the same page with with the budget staff and, and we're on the same page with the council. I have a question, Mr. Mayor, if I might. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, th and thanks, Tom, uh, for that. The um, and that, that's an important clarification, I think, because I'm. Is it still really a full eight million that we'll be getting from that sale or have we already charged the money we spent on McDougal Terrace to that pool of money? Um, so is, is, is it safe? Is it, is it fair to still think of it as a full eight million? Yes. Okay. And you'll you'll get an update, uh, you know, during the, this session on from community development. But those McDougal Terrace monies, as I recall, came out of other other sources in the um, dedicated housing fund. Okay. All and right. Bertha or anybody else who's on can certainly correct me, but I believe that's the case. Okay. And and we've made no determination that those those funding streams are going to be replenished from that. Eight million dollars. That that is is that a fair characterization? Uh, that that's but, my understanding. That'd be correct. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Tom. Bertha, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I do not. Again, those those dollars aren't budgeted here because there's not there was no decision made about where where they would land. Um, initially, yes, they'll come through the general fund, uh, but we, you know, transition those, transfer those to wherever wherever it's decided. And then I think uh, when Reginald Johnson presents, uh, I think the questions about we there is no plan to replenish those dollars, but I'm sure um, he'll be happy to share with you his thoughts around that. Sure, thank you. And, and just to be clear, my and um, please, I, I may be misremembering, but I, I thought that the eight million dollars was being placed in general fund as opposed to going directly to uh, the affordable housing fund, precisely because of things like we do with Harris, because we were anticipating needing money for actions um, like McDougal Terrace. So that that I. I seem to remember that kind of conversation kind of swirling around uh, the money, but but I, I could be wrong. So well, I, th I think those conversations did happen, Councilmember Middleton, in some in some regard. But just in terms of the the accounting flow of funds, you know, they they the revenues need to flow through the general fund initially because that's that's where the asset is located, okay. and then you know your decisions about appropriations from uh, would in essence be from fund balance at the end of the day. Uh, of the general fund to other purposes would be would be your decision. Uh, I think there, you know, there was it uh, uh, certainly back in the what seems like an eternity ago, quite frankly, <laughs> Long time ago. Uh, uh, when we were talking about where where how how much money would be needed for McDougal Terrace, not just the initial appropriation, but the ultimate in any ultimate, which I, I think we still don't know uh, mm -hmm. because of the other commitments that. Um, um, the uh, affordable housing, you know, fund has, uh, there was a, you know, thought that there wouldn't, you know, potentially wouldn't be enough there. And so some people said, well, we have all that extra money in the general fund, uh, whether, uh, I don't even recall, quite frankly, that it was the, the uh, Chapel Hill Street sale. I think that was uh, kind of uh, at some, in some fashion uh, suggested for even other purposes than McDougal Terrace, uh, that, but, but still the, it, it still rolls up to the general, the general fund. Um, but of course, a lot of things have changed since then, and uh, th there will be, you know, some some challenging decisions uh, along the way. Thank you. Fair enough. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to add, uh, appreciate that explanation, um, and I think that uh, the key thing that I know the council is interested in is that once that money is received uh, and Congratulations to the staff on continuing those important negotiations and looking forward to their success. Um, that the council be consulted uh, before we expend those funds. And Tom, I appreciated your uh, assurances on that. I've, I've uh, we, you know, a lot of us have talked um, over the last few weeks about this, and uh, we've had some discussion at council, some individual discussions amongst all of ourselves, and. So um, I think it's, you know, that's going to be important to the council. Absolutely. I do have one other question, Bertha, about, um, about the previous slide, which is, can you remind me, uh, you probably told us last time, about the assumptions in the out years. Are we, what are we assuming about pay? Are we assuming that we're going back to our, our uh, previous assumptions around pay and benefits? Yes, yes, we are. Okay, so we have pay increases in the out years built into this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, so let me ask you one, let, let me ask you one more question, Bertha. This could be also at the end of your presentation, whenever you feel like answering this, but when you think ahead about um, what is the biggest risk that we're facing? We know we have a strong ability to control our expenses. Um, we know that uh, I think we have fairly strong confidence in our property tax. You know, we know what the we know what the um, we know what the assessment is already. Of, you know, the, for the, all the properties, um, we don't know exactly what the what the collection rate is going to be. But is the biggest risk? It seems to me is the biggest risk is sales tax really falling out from what we project even our lower projections 
would you agree that that's the biggest risk or are there other big risks that you see on the horizon? I agree, sales tax is the, is the biggest risk. Um, and of course, those businesses um, in terms of their ability to, to even come back and, and, and bring that sales tax back you know, up quickly. So absolutely, um, a lot of it comes from construction as well. And when construction is, is stalled, um, other than nonprofit organizations, you know, we lose the sales tax there. Um, it's, and it's so much uncertainty around it. And even if we, you know, could project the numbers, it's just when, when are we going to get back to uh, where we were? And is that going to happen over, you know, one year? Uh, Dr. Walden seems to think it's going to go into uh, 22. So, um, and, and that's what he shared with us. And so how long it will take us to get back to Tom's point about, you know, uh, saving our, our fund balance. Um, because again, the only, only significant changes you can make or the only way you can make up dollars if you don't have savings is you have to get into to people because mo majority of our expenditures is personal services uh, pay and benefits. Thank you, Bertha. So to that point, um, you know, what we need to do carefully, and so I don't want, and I think Tom said this or alluded to this, is, you know, this budget is not a budget that we, you adopt in June and we can't amend it at some point. Uh, we can amend it July 1. Uh, and so we will continue to monitor our revenues and expenditures and, you know, provide our quarterly financial reports to you all and share with you if we're on target, you know, what's going on on the revenue side. Um, and, and amend the budget if needed. So it's not making a decision now and you can't make an, another decision until the budget, um, the next budget process. And that's how sometimes people characterize the budget. We make a decision now and we don't get another opportunity. Uh, that's certainly not true. Every year we do a carryover mid-year where we look at what actually came in at the end of the year and where we were and we make adjustments to the budget um, at that time. Uh, and we do amendments throughout the year. So we'll continue to, to closely look at those, you know, monthly and share with you quarterly. Uh, we are continuing to work on our multi-year financial plan. So your point about pay and benefits, you know, looking at where we ended this year and what the numbers will look like with we um, bringing back the, the, the pay adjustments uh, next year. Um, strategies to look at gaps, you know, it's, it, you know, the go-to was fund balance and we didn't really have another option because there's so much uncertainty and we want to balance that with not making drastic decisions on personal on, on the employee side and, and and not being really in a position to make those you know exact projections at this time and we will continue you know one of the things that tom insisted upon is that we continue to check in with our departments you know based on the reductions that we made to make sure that they're able to continue to uh you know provide training or certifications or money for certification and other things that may be necessary to continue to assess their needs and make adjustments as, as necessary. And this is just uh, a, a look at just a summary of the property uh, tax, you know, pre-COVID uh, compared to budget and uh, what our numbers, uh, what our losses were. And, you know, when we talk to um, our employees, we talk about, you know, again, the property tax and sales tax being so significant that there's no other place for us to go to get to get additional revenues in the general fund. So just another summary again, we, um, our, our loss uh, was 12.7 million. Um, we are now using 8.7 from fund balance because of the additional 1.5 for gas tax. Um, you know, hopefully that number will not be more than 25% uh, for, for gas tax, but the other concern is also, and, you know, even with sales tax and, you know, all of our state shared revenues, you know, we also don't know what the state is going to do in terms of trying to make up, you know, their, their deficit. And so we have to be careful um, as we look at our state shared revenues um, and having additional uh, resources available if the state decides to change some of its methodology and sharing formula. And again, um, we're going to look quarter by quarter. There may be some other adjustments that need to be made after July 1. We'd certainly bring those to you um, and, um, and the manager would share them with you prior to us coming forward um, with the decision. So I believe that's my last slide. Um, I'm happy to take any additional questions. Um, Thank you, Bertha. 
<coughs> excuse me, anybody have any questions for Bertha, please go ahead and speak up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I don't really necessarily have a question right now, although I'm sure stuff will come up. I just wanted to say a few words of thanks to our staff for uh, what has been easily the most difficult budget cycle and will continue to be the most difficult budget cycle of my tenure on the council. And I'm sure in the uh, in the work of the staff that prepared this uh, these these presentations in this new budget, I, I've heard uh, as all of us have heard uh, during the last several weeks um, calls from certain um, from lots of folks in our community um, about the possibility of using more fund balance right now to do various things. And I just want to say that from my perspective. The way that staff is proposing to handle it during this budget cycle is exactly the way we ought to be handling it. Um, I think it, it, the fact that we are in such a good position with respect to our fund balance is a testament to how well managed the city has been uh, for many years. And the fact is, uh, we've also heard over the years uh, calls for us to use more fund balance to do other types of things. Uh, sometimes we have um, done that, uh, but for the most part, we have been vigilant as stewards of the public money and um, and this year is why. This is why our staff, our, our manager, um, and as council members, we have been as vigilant as we have been over the years because now we are in a position to make up and to use $8.7 million of fund balance uh, to make up for lost revenue and still be in the position to sustain additional revenue losses if, as I fear, the sales tax numbers uh, uh, continue to be bad. And, the, and, and, and Bertha, you pointed out, the problem is we won't know until October whether or not that's gonna happen. Um, and so the ability to have this cushion and the understanding that we need to be ready for additional changes is something that I just wanna say, I'm really proud uh, of, of our staff um, and the difficult decisions that have, that have resulted in where we are right now. Um, as I said, I don't have any specific questions. I do want to say that um, that you know we we will get through this budget cycle. Um, we're gonna. I suspect we will have to make more hard choices um, as the fiscal year goes forward. But I do want to say that the chart um, that I think merits more long term decision is the multi year financial plan for the for the general fund that's slab fifteen. I think what we are going to we're going to need to be focused over the next couple of years at, at getting the city um keeping the city on a on a solid financial footing this is not a one bad budget cycle and then we're back to we're back to business as usual uh, not only because of the deep red numbers you see in those projections but also because we don't know what our economy is going to look like um as a result of COVID 19. Uh, we don't know what the restaurant industry is going to look like in Durham and North Carolina and around the country and the world after uh, after COVID nineteen, and so we you know we uh, I think it's really important to get through this cycle as best we can to focus on giving us ourselves flexibility during the fiscal year as it moves forward, but also to say that we've got to keep our eye uh, looking a little bit down the road to make sure that we understand that it's not just one budget cycle of tough choices. We're gonna to have to do this for a while now as we kind of figure out what our new normal is. Um, like I said, I don't have any specific questions. Stuff will certainly come up, but I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to say how proud I am um, to serve with the folks who are doing this really hard work. Um, none of this is easy, but you've made it as easy for us as possible. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Brees. Great comments, thank you. Any other questions or comments on this on this presentation? If not, we'll move ahead. Um, before we move ahead, let me just ask. Um, I would like to uh, get uh, split up the chairing a little bit today, uh, and uh, I've already spoken to Mayor Pro Tem Johnson about that. Uh, she has her kids at home, <laughs> uh, and. Um, what I have been thinking about doing is that I would chair through this next uh, presentation. Uh, and then, um, Mayor Pro Tem, you can let me know via chat or otherwise if you would like to chair through uh, the next couple presentations. And then I thought Councilmember Reese is our next 
as our other senior member, you might want to share through uh, the transportation presentation. Um, that sounds fine, so Mr. Mayor. The kids have kids have chilled out a bit, so okay, we're good. Sounds good to right. me, Mr. Mayor. I'm locked away in my bedroom, and hopefully, my children can leave me alone uh, <laughs> okay. for a little while. So just Thank let me know. You. All right, great. So I'll just share. Uh, we don't need to do much sharing today, which is great. It's all really in the hands of Bertha and company. Uh, but um, insofar as we need it, I'll I'll go through um, pay and benefits. Then, uh, Jillian, if you'll do general services, Parks and Rec, and Charlie, if you'll do transportation. Is that good? All righty. Bertha, we're back to you. So I'll turn it over to Regina Youngblood for the pay and benefits presentation. Thank you, Bertha. Regina Youngblood, Human Resources Director, here to present to you the pay and benefits presentation for fiscal year 21. So as you've just heard in Bertha's revenue uh, presentation, that there's a lot of uncertainty around our revenues due to COVID-19. And so the city has found itself in the unenviable position of recommending no pay increases be budgeted for fiscal year 21. While we are not budgeting pay increases for FY21, the city is still going to maintain uh, its contribution to employees 401ks at 5%. And what I wanna make sure that you know is that the share of city benefits costs is increasing by approximately 9% this year. So the, the last time that we entered into a situation where we weren't able to give pay increases to employees was back in 2009. In that year, uh, no general employees or firefighters received increases. And then in 2010, no increases were provided to all city employees, and that was during the Great Recession. In the general fund, there are benefits increases. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the, the city's share of its contribution for benefits is increasing by approximately 9%, which equates to about $3 million. The greatest amount of that, again, is for health insurance and also increases to our retirement contributions for employees and to the local government employee retirement system. In addition to that, there are some decreases for pay in the budget of approximately $500,000 uh, compared to the current year. And those decreases are due to reductions in part-time, and some full-time salaries that were being moved to different funding sources. So the net pay and benefits increase for the 21 budget is $2.5 million. I mentioned that there were some increases to the city's contribution and benefits. We also had to increase the employee contribution for benefits in both of our plans this year. Uh, our lower cost plan, Aetna Whole Health, had been subsidizing our higher cost plan, Whole Health Plus. The loss ratio of our higher plan was approximately 126%, and the loss ratio of the Whole Health plan is about 78%. And so to move individuals to change their behavior, we increased the premiums for Whole Health Plus by 15% and to maintain uh, enough revenue in the insurance fund, we also increased whole health premiums by 3%. So the impact of the increase of 15% on whole health plus, the greatest amount is going to be seen or in, in felt an impact on individuals that have family coverage. That is, a difference of $45.20 per month, and that comes out to about $542.52 per year, or to break it down by pay period, an additional $20.86 per pay period for those increases related to Whole Health Plus. But we've kept the Whole Health option very affordable. That 3% increase for Whole Health uh, and the family rate really just comes out to a difference of $4.79 over the previous year. So employees have the ability to pay less for their benefits if they're willing to switch to the lower cost option.
our COVID response included the need to furlough approximately 176 employees. As you can see, most of those employees are coming from our parks and rec department. Just to give you some demographics associated with the furloughed individuals, 76% uh, of the individuals furloughed are black, 18% white, 3% Hispanic, and 3% all others. The greatest amount of individuals furloughed happen to be females. About 56% of the furloughed employees are females. And as you've heard some of these details before when we were talking about uh, the $15 an hour minimum, during minimum livable wage for part-time employees, we shared some statistics around Parks and Rec and we find that the Parks and Rec part-time employees tend to be people of color and, and largely women. The city implemented a temporary premium pay policy to help recognize the employees that were working in the front lines uh, during this COVID crisis, those individuals that are resident facing, having high contact with the public and working in teams and work groups where they're not able to socially distance themselves. That premium pay that started a couple of months, a month or so ago, uh, was 5% on top of their regular pay. We have right now about 1,339 employees who have received premium pay through May 22nd. The cost of that has been around $521,000. The slide says that the succession date is to be determined, but we had a conversation about this yesterday. And for now, the decision is being made to have the premium pay, which was due to expire at the end of this month, extended through June 19th. And so what you see here on the slide where it says that an estimated additional 414,000 would accrue if we kept going to the end of fiscal year 20, that number would be decreased by about 130,000 uh, because there's only two more pay periods between now and uh, June 19th. Something that we also did in response, if you can go back to the next, the past slide, John, for me, thank you, uh, in response to COVID-19 was to give every employee in the city hired before May 1st, the equivalent of five weeks of leave. We've called this leave COVID leave, but it can be used for any purpose as long as it is pre-approved and this leave will not expire, but it does not have a compensable value. So individuals cannot cash this out if they have balances remaining when they leave the city its employment. Do you have any questions? Council members, anyone with questions or comments? Council member Freeman. Thank you. Uh, whole, I uh, first and foremost want to thank you all for the presentations and say that I also um, agree with council member Middleton, I mean, council member Reese and noting just how hard and difficult the um, pulling all this together has been. So I just want to put that as a preference, preference or pre preface to the com comments that I'm making. But um, I wanted to know, when you apply a race equity lens to this um, recommendation for the human resources department, and you say 76% of the people who were who were furloughed were black and they're black and of the 76% more than half are women is there anything that you applied or sh any shifts that you make differently in what you would recommend like have you walked through and or just walk me through what difference you made and and how um, you you came to the decision around um, the budget being around 3 or the numbers being around 3 million and landing at 2.5 with the decrease in, in pay? Well, the decisions around who was to be furloughed, um, those decisions were made department by department based on the services that had to be scaled back or ceased completely due to COVID-19. And it is coincidental, um, but not something that we shouldn't look at, that the individuals who were working in those programs that needed to be 
reduced or closed happen to be you know people of color and I, and I think I say that because I, I realize when you say coincidental that that you realize that that's not how it works and that's exactly what keeps it going as far as noting that they're the people who are most disproportionately vulnerable are those at the margins and those are usually people of color and if the decision was made to furlough those workers you have to at some point take into account some type of race equity in this conversation and figure out how to address it because it's not going to change if we do uh, it the same way. Councilman Freeman I appreciate that and I, and I, uh, I understand the, the concern I think it I want to be um, sensitive to uh, you know the the individual employees who were impacted, but at the same time, I think it would be helpful maybe if we provided uh, all of the demographic demographic information um, for the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, because certainly the profile of that department uh, is not what you would see as consistent with say the the profile of our community. I think it's is substantially um, more. Uh, include um, uh, diverse, so I think if maybe we could provide you some additional uh, backup background information about the starting place, uh, that may may be helpful. But I, I certainly understand and appreciate uh, the questions and concerns that uh, that you're raising. I don't know that you're going to show me that if it's 76 percent, and there's that would be a huge shift in the way that the, the demographics in the parks and rec look. Well, again, I, I think we want to go back and take take a look at that and and be sure that uh, um, you know it's consistent with what I think it is. But uh, um, it is a good question and information that we we can provide without necessarily disclosing individuals' names, but I mean, protecting some privacy there, but still providing a backdrop of that demographic. We can do that pretty easily. We can do that, Tom, and 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 that kind of echoes what I said before that the demographics of park and parks and rec um, do run towards heavily female and people of color. Just making sure you're taking that into account. And in thank you. Those decisions. Thank you. Uh, so I've got the data now It's 62% black parks and rec is the demographic 53% female. Thank you for that. Thank you for that important question council member. Others, Mr. Mayor, questions for Regina? Mr. Mayor, for mine. Uh, we'll, we'll go first to Council Mayor Milton and then I believe Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, for allowing me. And thank you, uh, Mayor, and, and thank you, Regina. Uh, good to see you. Um, in addition to the demographic information, I, I'd be curious as to the actual job titles and functions of the folk that were furloughed. Um, because th this, for me, this, this, um, statistic about the folk we furloughed or the number of folk we furloughed to me is going to inform um, how I look at any other requests for FTEs um, citywide from other departments because as I said I think at our last meeting for me the metric now is what is mission critical what is absolutely mission not just adding value or increasing efficiency but what is mission critical my assumption is that some determination was made that furloughing these folk we looked at what we could do absolutely and what we could not do and, and who was absolutely mission critical. I mean, when I see departments like the police department as well, furloughing people, um, I, you know, for me, that's going to uh, um, raise my standard of scrutiny uh, as other departments come and ask for FTEs. If, we, if we're going to bring on FTEs on one part, but furlough people in other parts, then to me, there's got to be some type of uh, ability to say, this is absolutely mission critical. Um, I hope that we will uh, uh, at some point be able to bring those folk back or, or, or provide an opportunity for those folk to get back. I appreciate the demographic information, but even beyond that, I, I, I'd be curious as to exactly what the job title and duties of these folk who were furloughed in each department uh, that's been listed here. I just want to serve notice that this, this will be very much informing my consideration of the rest of the budgetary ask from other departments uh, moving forward. So I just wanted to put that on record. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Councilmember Milton, I think several of those questions may be uh, at least uh, informed. I don't want to say answered, presumed to be answered, but at least informed uh, as we move through some of these departmental presentations with those, the, the, the specificity of the positions and the programs that uh, that would either be suspended or uh, or, fur or furloughed, depending on how you want to describe it. 
-hmm. Absolutely. And to be clear, I'm, I'm not telegraph. I haven't made any. I'm just reserving judgment uh, until those. And I appreciate that, Tom. And I, I'm sure they will be. Appreciate Thank that. You. So Thank just, you, sir. Just quickly uh, on on that to answer some of your questions and we can get you the specific details of all of the lists. But in Parks and Rec, it was lifeguards, facility attendants and school crossing guards and and, and police and uh, transportation. It's uh, parking ambassadors and 911 and water management had some administrative staff. Okay. All right. Regina, I think it would be good to get that in writing when you get a chance. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so um, much. We've got several people lined up for questions. We're gonna to go to Mayor Pro Tem, then we've got a council member Freeman and then council member Reese. Thank you. Uh, and thanks Regina for your presentation. I also just had a couple of questions about furloughs. Um, I know you mentioned in Parks and Rec there was a lot of part-time workers. Have we furloughed full-time workers in Parks and Rec or in any other department? No. All of these folks on this list are part-time? Correct. Okay. And is the plan, I, I know now folks who are on furlough are um, eligible for federal benefits for the special federal um, COVID benefits. Do we continue to provide health insurance or um, for employees who are on furlough? Yes, we do. Um, and of course, with part-time individuals, not all part-time workers qualify for our health benefits. They need to be working at least 30 hours um, to a, a week to, to qualify for the benefits. And of the 176 individuals furloughed, there were two who are eligible for benefits and they have been given the option to continue their benefits and they just need to pay for those directly. The other thing that I want to you know, communicate is that <clears throat> when we gave the five weeks of COVID leave to every employee or the equivalent of five weeks based on their work schedule, that included part-time individuals and several of these furloughed individuals continue to have COVID leave that they can access to continue to receive a paycheck. Right now, there's approximately uh, four days worth of leave left on average that each of these individuals have. Okay, thank you. So um, when you say pay for that directly, you mean COBRA? No, they, they continue to receive the employee rates, but okay. they have to, we normally take the money out of their paycheck, but if they're not receiving a paycheck, they have to do a direct bill. Okay, got it. Um, and I'm Im I imagine we don't have a sense of when we might be able to bring folks back and with parks and rec programming, I know a lot of that is suspended. Um, indefinitely. Do we have a sense with any of the other departments when, when or we, if we might be able to bring folks back on? We did ask, actually. And so Parks and Rec, as well as all of the other operational departments, have been working very closely with budget management services in uh, their reopening government work. And so Parks and Rec says that they should be able to bring some people back by mid-July and then begin to slowly reopen programs between July and September. Uh, there are no firm plans, and Sean Egan can speak to this when he speaks in transportation, uh, to bring back those individuals uh, that were parking ambassadors, but possibly parking enforcement would begin in June, and so that might be the first time we see some of those people coming back. Police, again, I mentioned that, that those are all school crossing guards that were furloughed, and so that will have to align with when school begins. And water management does not have any plans to bring back that one individual because they were already phasing that one down. Thank you. If, if I could just jump in too, just to kind of reiterate and, and any confusion, the, the furlough situation um, was not a cost cutting measure of the budget. Uh, it, it does impact some reductions in costs, but it was more about programs that were not able to be provided and, uh, and many of those programs were in fact performed by um, part-time people. So, uh, you know, the, the, the program isn't provided, that's why the position was furloughed. It wasn't uh, furloughed to, uh, to cut costs. So there, you know, there's a portion of the, the cost reductions obviously that are built in the budget, but it, and, it, and it impacted how we balance the budget, but that wasn't what, you know, kind of precipitated or drove the, the furlough decision. It was really more that the programs themselves, particularly the summer programs in parks and recreation were not going to be provided uh, or not going to be able to be provided this summer. And as indicated, you know, particularly in parks and recreation, but also transportation, you'll hear more about those details uh, shortly when we get to those departmental presentations.
Thanks, Samba Topol. Thank you, thank you, Tom. And uh, now we'll go to Council Member Freeman and then Council Member Reese. I had a specific question regarding the benefits, um, specifically when you said the, the cost of the medical premiums increased and the lower cost was due to wellness activities and not like service. I wanted to make sure that was clear, that it was not a service decrease. It was just like if you participated in wellness activities. That's correct. Yeah. That's right. So we ask everybody to do a biometric screening and also to do two additional activities. Um, and, and there may be another requirement there that I'm, I'm blanking on right now, but those wellness activities get them the wellness rate. And then I think Council Member, Council Member Middleton and um, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson asked my questions as well. So glad I waited. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. I, uh, just uh, before um, Council Member Reese goes, just to follow up on one thing, uh, Regina. Um, does, is there someone assigned in every department to, I believe the answer to this is yes, to work with employees in that department and kind of remind them about their, their need for the, for the uh, to do the things that are necessary for the reduction in cost, you know, the wellness things? Yes. We call them HR champions. Every department has an HR champion and we hold monthly champions meetings to make sure that we're pushing out information through them as well as through message managers within the city. And we also do direct emails to every employee as it relates to their wellness requirements specifically. Would you do me a favor or would you do us a favor? Uh, and maybe this could be someone in the clerk's office or, or maybe someone in your office. Um, the, when I was reading through the benefits book, uh, there's a lot of specific information directed to council members. And if there was someone, maybe I guess probably in your office rather than the clerk's office, I'm not sure how to do this, that would just be in touch with us council members to make sure that we know what we're supposed to do. Sure. I feel like we're sort of outside the information loop on the system. We certainly get the emails, but uh, I know that uh, over the years, uh, I felt a little bit outside this information loop. We could discuss that later, uh, but I think it would be helpful. Make sure that we're doing all the things we need to do. Will do. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, um, a lot of the things I wanted to get clarified have already been gone through, but I just wanted to say that listening to, hearing Council Member Middleton's remarks about the furloughed employees uh, the employees who are currently furloughed versus uh, new FTEs being requested in the upcoming fiscal year budget made me want to ask about kind of the how those two things are related. And I think the city manager made it really clear that the decisions on furlough that were made um, in mid-March when we started getting into the COVID-19 public health emergency were not a cost-saving measures. They were directed at programming that it's no longer safe to do. Um, and I think that is definitely true for our part-time employees in Parks and Rec uh, who are currently in a furloughed, are currently furloughed. I, I guess from a budgetary perspective, what is the, like, what are the assumptions built into the, the proposed budget around those furloughed employees? Are we, are we, do we have like new start dates built into the model? Um, uh, maybe that's a, a first step at trying to get at that. So um, as it relates to the budget in terms of the individual employees, um, we did not remove, um, we, we, did we did remove some revenues from parks and recreation budget. And I think that number was about 300,000. And then when Joy Guy speaks, she, she can talk about her projections for her part-time employees. I think that would be the best a way to respond to that question is allow her to talk about what it, it ties to when she plans to, when they project bringing folks back online. So I, 
I defer to her to talk about that when she uh, does her presentation. Okay. That's, um, that's great. Cause I, I guess if there, if, if, if it's true that there is a specific plan that DPR has for bringing their furloughed employees back online, um, and it's, it's related to kind of the expectation and projections about when programming can begin. Um, I guess I'm curious, number one, to understand what that looks like and what kind of public health assumptions are built into that. But also, I think from a budget perspective, it helps us understand that, uh, that it's not especially clear that, that, we're, that we're furloughing employees to save money that we're then using to hire new employees. I don't think that that is not how I understand what's going on. And I just want to make it real clear that obviously that would be bad uh, at some level. Um, but it doesn't appear that that's what's happening, um, and I just wanted to get that out into the into the conversation. But I'll I'll wait until we get to DPR to ask more specific questions about that that kind of re restarting the programming that we've just decided right now is not not really safe uh, to do from a public health perspective. Um, that's great. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is I'm uh, while I'm not thrilled about the increases in um, employee contributions. Um, I think, you know, we are where we are, but I, again, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm really grateful to the administration for finding a way to maintain um, the 401k uh, support for employees. I think that's really, really important, especially for our employees who are nearing retirement age. And so just wanted to express my gratitude for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. Uh, any other questions for Regina? Mr. Mayor, if I might. Sure. Sure. I just want to uh, clarify um, some things that I said. Um, th there is cost saving that occurs when uh, an organization is just being fiscally responsible and kind of proactively looking for ways to cut costs. And that goes on, you know, notwithstanding what's going on around you. That, that's just the default position that healthy organizations engage in. And then there is a cost cutting that occurs because you have to, because you have less money. And um, the reason why these, these employees are being furloughed, uh, my understanding is that because COVID, had, we, we weren't looking to furlough these folk had COVID not occurred. Um, and, and my understanding that the, the overall amount of money that our organization will have to, to, to deal with is being impacted by COVID. Uh, and because of that, uh, when I say I'm gonna be looking at strict scrutiny for, for things that are mission critical uh, to the organization, uh, what I mean by that is, yeah, we're, we're not cutting costs, but our money's been cut. And therefore, because our money's been cut, uh, we're cutting costs, not because we're looking to save money, but because we just have less of it. So it, insofar as that is the, the case in which we're operating, the condition under which we're operating as an organization, as a city, uh, when I look at uh, FTE request, uh, because we have less money and because we're going to be trying to right foot, put ourselves on right footing financially, the next several years, uh, this year in particular. We, we've told everybody in the city uh, that we've got less, we've got to tighten our belts. Um, so because of that, when I look at FTE requests, um, I'm not just gonna be bringing a lens as to, to cutting costs, uh, but I'm gonna be bringing a lens that we literally have less money to do things. And like any other household, there are household, uh, heads of household watching this meeting right now, who if their money's cut, they have to make decisions. Maybe we're not going on vacation this year. We don't get to buy the extra car. Uh, just like, And this is a big big old house and a big old family. So as one of the leaders of this house, uh, I'm not looking to cut just to save money. We literally have a crisis where we have less money. So I wanna be clear that my I'm not tethering the furloughed employees as a cost cutting measure to, are we? am I gonna agree to hire new people on the other end or we're taking P robbing Peter to pay Paul Peter and Paul both have less money, uh, is my point. So I just want to be very clear on that, that I'm very clear that there's no causal linkage between cutting costs on one to get money to hire other people. The house has less money overall. Um, and I just want to, you know, uh, just be clear that that's the, the, the uh, prism that, I, that I'm looking through all the decisions, at least all of my decisions moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to be clear about that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. Any more comments or questions for Regina? Mr. M Mr. Met, just if I might. Sure. Uh, in, in light of um, Council Member uh, Middleton's comments, I think it would be good for me to say that I'm, I am tethering 
the race equity aspect to this in the conversation and context of recognizing that if we continue to do things the way we've been doing them, which is to look at where's the easiest place to cut or the easiest place to furlough or the easiest way to, to shift and move without regard of race or gender, then we'll get the same results. And so I do want to make sure that I push in and saying like, we, we've got to figure out ways to do it differently and to spell it out clearly. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Thank you everybody for all these good questions and comments. And now um, we're gonna move on to our next presentation. And I'm gonna turn the chairing over to you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, for the next two uh, presentations. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I believe all I have to do now is turn it over to our General Services Director, uh, Gina Probst. Well, good morning, everyone. Gina Probst, General Services Director. I'm happy to be here today and to share with you updates on our department's COVID-19 response, primarily talking about what we did during March and April, and then share out how our changes and efforts will influence our operations through fiscal year 21, and then share out some updates on our budget highlights. Next slide, please. Specifically, I would like to make sure that everyone is aware of who our heroes and heroines have been during the COVID-19 um, event for the city. And typically general services is um, available in a resource for severe weather events and emergency response. This year and this time, our custodial services team has been the team that has been the emergency responders on behalf of the city for our city facilities to ensure that they have stayed clean and safe and sanitized while they've been occupied. So the heroes and heroines during this time period has been custodial services. So I wanted to make sure that they are given accolades for their hard work. What we've done during the months of March and April is we've adjusted our central cleaning services to the facilities where we had um, occupied staff and continue to evaluate where our facilities are occupied. And um, we've also increased our frequency. We've added additional deep cleaning processes and protocols. We've in, um, increased sanitation of surfaces, door doorknobs, elevator buttons, um, common areas, chairs, anything and everything that could get touched has been improved and increased with our custodial services response. And in doing so, we've been um, using all approved CDC and EPA supplies. We've also um, invested in some new um, equipment, including some misting sprayers, some um, electrostatic devices, so that when we move through our facilities, there's a cleaning process followed by a disinfectant process. Um, those protocols have, have been what we've been doing during March and April will continue and have continued through May and will be part of our, um, our routine processes moving forward. And as we adjust our team members based on reoccupancy of various facilities, we also are getting prepared to, in the new fiscal year, address summer camp locations when and if they become open. During March and April for our facility maintenance side, we scaled down our services based on what was essential. However, we did keep and continue to provide routine preventive maintenance and oversight of all of our mechanical systems during the um, shutdown time period or the time when we had less occupancy in our facilities. So those protocols stayed in place and have continued. We adjusted staff schedules um, to respond just to emergency and urgent work orders during that time. And we, um, adjusted our staff to ensure that we had facility checks on buildings that were not occupied, including some of our smaller rec centers and coordinated with Parks and Rec as to which department would check in on different facilities during um, March and April. We are now in a process and have been since um, early May of returning um, our staff to work and are addressing projects that were previously on hold. Next slide, please. Here are some pictures and images of the supplies that we've been using that are CDC and EPA recommended, as well as some of the um, um, other types of um, supplies that we use to disseminate dis disinfectant. We have um, closely coordinated the types of um, materials and supplies that we're using and in, um, in consultation with risk management as well. So um, this allows our team to work uh, more efficiently and effectively when they are in various spaces using misters and electricity electrostatic devices to, um, to disinfect. 
Next slide, please. During our COVID response, we have been very mindful to um, and have paid attention to stay at home orders and how we've adjusted our cemeteries operations and um, ensuring that we've complied with the number of folks that have been at various um, burial services, depending on um, the updates from the stay at home orders. Our burial appointments have now um, been focused primarily Monday through Friday and we have been doing weekends as needed. We've adjusted our office hours to Monday through Friday from 10 to two so that we could um, employ social, safe social interaction and procedures and um, have created that window of time for appointments. Um, and as of May 4th, we've returned to our traditional normal hours for um, maintenance of the facilities as well as um, other operations at cemeteries. During the, months, during the months of March and April, we deemed landscaping and urban forestry services not essential, and we were able to suspend some of those services, including mowing and um, some of the routine work that we do with urban forestry. Um, our landscaping units came back, scaled back um, as of April 13th, and urban forestry as of April 20th, and we have now um, returned um, our staff to work and are on their routine, regular um, mowing routes and traditional operations for urban forestry. Next slide, please. During this time, our project management, our real estate staff, our public art, sustainability, and other administrative staff have continued to provide the services that they typically provide. They've just been doing it remotely, We've been leveraging a lot of the virtual tools to ensure that we continue to have meetings with designers, um, pre-bid meetings, and, and other options. Um, our construction projects were initially put on hold. They resumed May 4th. We've been working very closely with risk management on our contractor guidelines to ensure that we have updated safety plans and protocols in place for when our team members are inspecting construction projects. We had deferred our real estate in-person closings. We will be resuming those June 1st with um, safe protocols in place. Um, our security projects, which was our access control and integration of our HVAC into a master web supervisor program, those, those projects continue during this time. And as of May 4th, our inventory staff has resumed its normal, normal operations. Next slide, please. So carrying on to how what we have been doing during the months of March and April have transitioned to May and what it looks like in the next fiscal year, we continue to look at how we um, schedule our work and our service delivery adjustments. We've been um, evaluating our, um, our timing of shifts based on the ability to ensure that our shifts come in safely and that we proceed with our wellness screenings. We've been doing our vehicle adjustments to limit the number of people in vehicles and in order to ensure social distancing compliance. So we've done all of that on the operational side with our teams and that will continue into um, the near future. We've increased the frequency of our facility cleanings. And again, that will also continue. Some facilities pre-COVID, we only clean three times a week. And now um, the recommendations are that if they are occupied, that we disinfect every 24 hours. So on um, buildings that are a Monday through Friday operation, we are cleaning five days a week. And those that are seven days, such as police 911, we have implemented a seven day regimen. We've also developed a custodial emergency response after hours protocol in conjunction with risk management. This is anticipation if there are issues that arose, um, you know, 24 hour facilities like our police or our 911 that we had a response team ready to go and um, sanitize and disinfect if necessary. Next slide, please. Following on with the additional contractor guidelines, we, as I stated before, we've got new safety plan um, protocols in place Things that we will be closely monitoring in next fiscal year and, and thereafter are our supply for PPE as well as other supplies that are new and different for our custodial team. We'll continue the management of our mechanical systems with a focus on ventilation and filtration. Um, we've been closely following recommendations from ASHRAE, from AIA, from WHO, from um, uh, CDC, the alphabet soup of um, those with jurisdiction that provide this information to ensure that we um, continue to keep our mechanical systems operating properly. 
Um, as well as during this time, we are leveraging um, all maintenance opportunities that we can in our unoccupied buildings so that we can do touch up paint and other things that typically are difficult when occupied. Currently, we're serving as a resource for city departments, working with the Office of Performance and Innovation, as well as risk management, as we look at restoration of services, how and whether um, facility modifications will be necessary, um, signage, how we can work to de-densify certain areas, and other mitigation efforts as we work to um, provide assistance to departments based on their needs. Next slide, please. Uh, moving into FY21, we will continue, as I stated previously, to evaluate our custodial staffing resources to ensure that we are right size for the increased frequency and schedule. Uh, we also will monitor and provide um, budget updates for any space adjustments or other mitigation efforts that arise out of our, um, our support for various departments monitoring our supplies. We do have more hand sanitizer stations on order. They've not arrived, but these are all things that have been put in place in order to make sure that we have a, a safe environment for folks to return to work. Continue to monitor our tree planting goals and look for creative funding so that we can plant some larger trees, as well as our focus on our cemeteries, ground maintenance and beautification and how we adjust our staff to address that. Next slide, please. Here's some images of some of the signage that our public art team has been working on that we'll continue to um, evaluate and change based on the needs. We'll have different signage for when the public returns, but thought that this was a creative way to ensure that we continue to have thoughtful communication about how we are to interact and behave when we are in, in our buildings. So finally, I have our resource allocation table. There, there's not much change. Um, from our operating budget, except to acknowledge increases for pay for performance, the FTE count remains the same. I believe that is our final slide. And before we get to questions, I want to just express my appreciation uh, to uh, Gina and the general services staff for doing just an incredible job in a, in a whole new environment and way of thinking. Uh, as you've seen, they've been able to, at this point, make uh, significant adjustments in the way they work uh, without uh, significantly increasing, uh, without increasing at all the, the FTE counts, something that we're gonna continue to, uh, to take a look at. Uh, they've been able to adjust their, uh, many of their operational resources to uh, be able to provide the enhanced uh, supplies and, and uh, uh, chemicals, those kinds of things that, are, that are go, go along with that work. But, uh, I just am truly appreciative of, of Gina and all of her team uh, who have uh, quietly been behind the scenes, but been thinking a lot about how uh, all of our facilities will be ready and safe for employees and the public when the time comes to return. So thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, so much for your presentation. Um, and thanks, Tom. That is an incredible amount of work and it's um, work that we don't often see. So thank you for um, making us aware of everything that your team is doing. Do we have questions from members of the council? Uh, council One member question, Rich. Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Sure, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I have I have a couple questions. The the personal service expenses on your charter up, Gina. What are the reasons for that again? Personnel services due to um, pay for performance. Okay. And, the, and that would be from the, the, the this current year's full year implementation, not mm -hmm. for next year. Correct. Okay. So can you pull that slide up? Yeah. Um, see the proposed 2021, Gina? Mm-hmm. Yes. Is higher than the current year. Can you talk me through that? Let's see if um, someone from budget is available to assist with that as well. This is John Allure, Assistant Budget Director, Budget Management Services. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I am quite confident that the that increase has to do, it's not only pay for performance, it's also the, the effects of the full implementation of the pay study. Uh, and, and with a lot of that, we when we budgeted it, we were unsure how that was going to hit departments uh, with different classes of employees. Obviously, in the case of general services, it, it hit them more severely than some other departments. 
And if you'll recall, the pay study implementation was January 1st. So it was mid-year. And this ends up being the, the full year implementation of those, I got uh, it. those changes. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, the, the ballpark fund, um, what's the, explain the, you'll see the, You see on the FY 2021, it's very different from every other year. I don't think we had an explanation of that. Could you talk us through that as well? This is another item that I think I'll need to defer to the budget department and or finance. As finance manages the ballpark fund, it shows up in our um, in our RAT table yeah. um, to the extent that we assist with capital projects, but the ins and outs of the ballpark fund is managed by finance. Let me also, while that, just to add to that, because I, maybe the same folks need to address it, uh, we haven't talked about the, the effect of the DPAC closing on city finances, and I wondered if that could also be wrapped up into... Uh, Mr. Mayor, I can talk about that when the time comes. Okay, great. With the... Uh, it's uh, John Alor again, uh, Budget Management Services. The large increase to the ballpark fund, if, if you look at... Um, uh, in, in the budget, there was a, about uh, a little over $800,000 increase to the ballpark fund. A lot of that had to do with capital maintenance, and that's why you're seeing that very, very large percentage increase for that fund. Great. Thank you. And then I guess, Tom, uh, the DPAC, do you want to talk? Sure. So uh, certainly, you know, the, the uh, Performing Arts Center operates under the same fiscal year as the city. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the the facility shut down in uh, early March and the shows and, the, and those kinds of things that were scheduled uh, were canceled. So uh, I do think the, uh, the, the year will end in a, in a favorable uh, way uh, for the DPAC, um, you know, uh, operations and performance. Um, so there won't really be a current year budget impact next year. Uh, and we are in uh, conversations with the, uh, the operators at PFM and Nederlander about what uh, what next year looks like. Uh, they have not made any official announcements yet, although we have a pretty good sense of what that looks like. So I'm not really prepared to to make that announcement, you know, right now or uh, you know, as a part of this session. Uh, but the the good thing is that uh, the way we have structured uh, DPAC, it is in a separate fund. Uh, it is a, a place that has has not uh, required any general fund resources to operate. And as a result of that, and from uh, from savings that we have uh, previously uh, incorporated, and the risk that the operator takes, uh, there is not going to be at this point any general fund uh, exposure uh, for the time period that the uh, the DPAC will will be uh, closed, waiting for uh, uh, conditions to change. Thank you very much, and thank you all for that good planning. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank and you, thank you, Gina. Mayor. I'm going to go to Council Member Reese and then Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Manager, do we have a city department with a newer department head than General Services? Oh, you're really testing my old brain, Council Member Reese. Uh, I think that uh, uh, transportation is fairly fairly new, and uh, General Services is fairly new, and I'm. Um, we certainly have an interim uh, Parks and Recreation Director who you'll hear from shortly. Um, I'm it was my sure. recollection that I thought Gina was made the director after we hired Sean. That, that's I, probably all correct. That, all of that is by way of saying that, um, that uh, Gina, you have done an amazing job under fire in your first year of leadership. I know you've been with the department for a long time, but as you have rapidly learned, uh, leadership has its own challenges and i just want to say um on behalf of the people of the city of durham how grateful i am for how you have risen to that challenge how you've led this department during one of the most difficult times uh in the history of how we try to administer this city uh general services has done an amazing job during this time uh, i have been impressed every time i've seen our general services employees out in the community doing that essential those essential services that we have to have and perhaps more importantly arming the other city departments to do their jobs safely uh, so gina i don't have any questions uh the the mayor got the the one thing i was going to ask about but i just wanted to thank you for uh for really stepping up and being the leader that we needed general services right now thank you thank you madam mayor Pro Tem. 
Thank you, uh, Council Member Reese and Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I would echo Council Member Reese's comments and appreciate the mayor asking many of my questions as well. And the one additional um, thing I was going to say is that the the way in which uh, general services highlights the way that they shifted in thinking around the art speaks to exactly what I was talking about in a previous conversation with Regina and I'm hopeful that the Parks and Rec has done the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind comments and please let me note that I have a, a great team and a wonderful team so I appreciate it but I can't take credit for it. So thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions from council members? All right. Thank you so much, Gina. And please do pass our appreciations on to your team as well. Um, our next presentation is Parks and Rec. I'm going to turn it over to Interim Director Guy. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope good everyone morning. is doing well this morning. Um, I am Joy Guy. I'm Interim Director of the Parks and Recreation Department. And I also have our assistant directors, Jason Jones and Tom Dawson, as well as Rich Hahn, our business manager uh, in the meeting. I'll give him a second to get the slide straightened out for us. Here we go. Um, our presentation will focus on a few highlights of the challenges and successes relating to our department's response to COVID. I will review our drafted phased reopening plan and the operational impacts that we project will occur in fiscal year 21 as a result of our projected delays in restoring programs and services. I will also review our allocation table. And first I will discuss our challenges. Um, to say we've been challenged by COVID is a bit of an understatement. Our mission, Durham Parks and Recreation, provides opportunities for the Durham community to play more, connecting our whole community to wellness, the outdoors, and lifelong learning. At our core, we work to engage and connect with our residents through our parks and trails and through our programs, services, and events, which has been a, a challenge during this difficult time. However, our staff are resilient and, and very creative. With the initial challenges of COVID and our response to the stay-at-home guidelines, they were more technical in nature. As a large operational department, our first challenge was to transition our staff from working in our recreation centers and facilities to telecommuting. Our recovery from the malware attack on the city added another dimension. However, we were able to transition our staff and continue much of the critical work that was required initially for us to coordinate with our participants to cancel or reschedule programs, services, and rentals, as well as to provide the necessary refunds where applicable. During our initial work from the stay-at-home period, our part-time staff were busy assisting with these processes, as well as catching up on required trainings, assisting with program research, and helping to connect with our participants. However, as we progress further into the stay-at-home time period, it was difficult to assign meaningful work to many of our part-time program support staff. It is for this reason that we made the difficult decision to furlough those that we could no longer keep productive. Ongoing challenges include our community's need to maintain mental and physical well-being. Our parks, trails, and open spaces have recently become even more of a respite from stress. A survey completed by our National Recreation and Park Association Park Pulse, citing parks are essential, especially during a health crisis, revealed that 83% of adults find exercising at local parks, trails, and open spaces essential to maintaining their mental and physical health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Ongoing challenges also include our need to maintain connectivity with our participants, specifically those we were routinely serving in our programs and centers and I will share more on these efforts momentarily. If I could go to the next slide, please. Um, our current challenge is to develop and implement a reopening plan to restore our programs and services for the community in a rapidly changing environment. 
As the stay-at-home orders are relaxed and restrictions are removed, we want to ensure we are well prepared to reopen our facilities and programs and reconnect with our residents. Our goals are to provide equitable access to our programs, make necessary modifications to our programs to adhere to recommended safety guidelines, and as we are able, to reactivate our furloughed employees. Hiring and training staff for essential positions is also a current challenge. We know our programs and services will be vital and continue to be vital for helping our residents maintain mental and physical health. And now we'll talk a little bit about our successes. Um, we've been able to keep our parks and trails open and safe for the recreational activities that are allowed under our stay-at-home order. We posted signage throughout our system to educate and promote the allowed activities and also posted signage to promote and remind users of safe social distancing guidelines. We implemented a park monitoring program, visiting our heaviest used parks and trails to inspect and monitor use and conditions and to report unsafe practices or violations. Our marketing team has done a great job in maintaining our website and using social media tools to also educate and promote safe recreational activities and leave no trace practices for our parks and trails. In April, our marketing team facilitated a marketing and communications in the time of COVID-19 North Carolina Recreation and Park Association virtual roundtable discussion for nearly 100 NCRPA members and students from across the state. Our staff shared their efforts in promoting our Leave No Trace programs, as well as our virtual Earth Day campaigns. Attendees were encouraged to share stories and strategies about how they are staying engaged and connected with their communities and how they are planning for what comes next. Our staff also responded with many great online virtual programs for children and adults to try to keep them entertained and healthy while at home. Some of the examples of these many programs include uh, basketball skills and drills with our partner Coach to Inspire, which is a nonprofit organization that par partners with our athletics uh, unit to provide student coaches for our youth athletic leagues and skills clinics. Our support and participation in the virtual One Mile Walk to support Special Olympic Spring Games in partnership with the Durham Academy. Virtual Muddy Boots and other programs offered by our outdoor recreation team. Our Zoom Hangouts, which are twice a week connect programs facilitated by our care program staff for our after school participants. Some of the activities included home scavenger hunts, get moving exercise routines and dance parties. These hangouts often included siblings and, and at times even parents. And as mentioned, we also hosted a virtual Earth Day celebration instead of the full festival. We partnered with Pulse Radio to promote and shared various tips, information, and videos via social media. Several organizations contributed to providing information, including the city's water management department, Keep Durham Beautiful, Stormwater, the city county sustainability office, etc. Bill Ray, meteorologist with CBS, also helped by recording a promotional commercial to promote the event. So we have worked hard to maintain connectivity with our community. We were able to complete online engagement surveys to gather input and information needed for playground replacement for two of our parks, Bay Hargrove and Drew Granby. We intend to be able to complete these and reopen as we are able to open playgrounds again. Staff have also assisted other departments and agencies. We've been involved in local, state, and national meetings providing recreational programs and services in this time of COVID. As mentioned, some of our staff helped facilitate roundtables with NCRPA. These networking efforts have strengthened, strengthened our relationships with our peers in the industry. And these relationships will continue to provide a great support network as we continue to navigate this uncharted territory. If I could go to the next slide, please. Other successes we have had over the past few months include staff completing online certification programs and training. Examples include our recreation specials, specialists and childcare programs completing a required course at Durham Technical Community College to obtain their child care credentials one and two. And we've had staff complete certification in spin bikes and also in pool operations to provide a few additional examples. Many staff completed updating their unit and program manuals, supporting necessary work and complying with accreditation standards. 
We worked with our technology solutions department and have been fortunate to restore our operating systems that were impacted by the malware attack. We continue to seek out flexible and creative solutions to complex problems as we learn to navigate our new normal. Can I do that to the next slide, please? Our National Recreation and Park Association has compiled guidance to help parks and recreation agencies with the development of reopening plans. We've taken advantage of the many resources and recommendations provided through their Path to Recovery program. In addition, we're in communication with regional parks and recreation agencies, including Raleigh, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and Cary, to discuss trends and prepare aligned reopening strategies where feasible. As NRPA has recommended, transitioning through the various phases of our plan will require meeting a set of outlined indicators and gating criteria, as well as the implementation of additional mitigation strategies to ensure our efforts continue to protect public health. Indicators that will be considered when transitioning between each phase. Effectively meet federal, state, and local phase progression guidelines and metrics as determined by public health officials. Conduct a risk ass assessment of all spaces, facilities, and programs. We will assess contact intensity, the number of contacts, and the degree in which activities are considered to be modifiable through mitigation strategies. We will ensure sufficient staff capacity and resources to support reopening, secure cleaning supplies, personal protective equipment, and establish and implement related standard operating procedures. We will ensure community awareness of public health measures and develop plans to scale up mitigation measures if needed. We recognize that changes in public health may require mitigation measures that slow our progression through the phases of the plan and might even require reverting back to a previous phase. We are resilient and prepared to pivot as necessary to ensure we continue to align with the recommendations of our public health officials, as well as federal, state, and local guidelines. Our phased approach in our reopening plan prioritizes public health and safety, considers equitable service delivery, and recognizes our adherence with all federal, state, and local guidelines. For these reasons, many of our offered programs will be at a reduced and or modified service level. This slide and the next slide of our plan will um, indicate those modified, those planned modified or reduced service levels by the highlighted blocks. So highlights of our phase one and what we've been able to restore so far. Um, of course, our parks and trails continue to be open. Tennis courts, pickleball courts, and disc golf courses were open on May 18. Private boat launches are now permitted at Lake Mickey and bank fishing began at both city lakes on May 22nd. For a review of phase two, we're planning to open dog parks and our park restrooms beginning June 1st. We'll have non-motorized boat rentals at city lakes to begin on June 19. And we anticipate opening our hike and park tours on June 22nd. And on into July, we anticipate providing teen and youth enrichment activities, as well as the My Durham Summer programs, uh, beginning on July 6th. Um, limited interaction, recreation and fitness programs, such as spin classes, arts and crafts, dance, etc. City Lake paddling programs and boat rentals, tennis leagues, open computer labs, and open fitness centers. And on the next slide, you'll see our phases three and four, which are now marked to be determined because of so much being unknown at this point as to when these will be allowed. Um, this phases three and four will include programs that have increased interaction and physical contact between participants or between staff and participants. Many of these programs also have higher participation levels. And so mass gathering limitations will need to be relaxed before we can resume them. Programs within these phases will open as guidelines allow. Go to the next slide, please. And these are our budget highlights. Um, our, we reduced our proposed budget by a total of $375,833. Um, and as discussed earlier, um, this, these were reductions that occurred because of our programs being closed. Um, these were totally operational. 
Um, 279,556 of this is due to reduced part-time staffing that we're projecting to continue to, to occur July through August, as well as the elimination of part-time staff increases for this year. An additional reduction of $96,277 in operational expenses were reduced just from reduction to training and travel. For example, we know our uh, state and national conferences uh, for this fall have already been canceled. Um, uh, printing publications, um, office supplies, uh, summer vehicle rentals, and some of the trips that we had planned for the fall. We also um, project a reduction of $252,600 in revenues, in program revenues. Um, and of course, this was due to our program cancellations and delays in, in opening, um, as well as a loss of our rental revenue from our uh, rental facilities. I don't know if we could go to our next slide. Um, and of course, this is our resource allocation table. Um, and even with the reductions that I just went through, um, our personnel line is still increasing by 11.9%. And this is attributed to the annualization of the current year's performance increases that were implemented in July 2019 for the benefit increases, the full-time pay study annualization. Um, those were all for the full-time employees. In addition, this includes the annualization of the part-time our minimal livable wage based pay plan that was implemented mid-year. On the capital line, you'll see a slight decrease of 6.7%. Um, this was also due to funds moved to personnel to cover the increase for annualizing salaries and benefits for our, posi our full-time positions that are funded uh, through the halfpenny tax for clerks. And I believe that is my last slide. And so at this point, I'm happy to uh, entertain questions. Great, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, your department and all departments have been um, significantly affected by COVID, but I think Parks and Rec um, is one of the ones that has seen the most impacts. So I just wanna thank you for all your work with navigating that and um, this very well thought out um, reopening plan that y'all put together. Questions from members of the council? Madam Mayor, protect me if I might. Absolutely, Councilmember Middleton. Thank you so much, and thank you, Joyce. It's good to see you, and uh, congratulations on your leadership during these challenging times um, as interim. I um, I was really, really looking forward to this uh, presentation, uh, and just full disclosure, uh, Parks and Rec um, has a very, very uh, special place in my consciousness as, as a just as a person, as a leader of this city. It, it was, it was um, really the brilliant kind of uh, conspiracy that my parents had with with the New York City Parks and Rec when I was younger uh, that I really I don't think it's an overstatement that they kept me alive uh, programming uh, that Parks and Rec did during the summer combined with free lunches at our local public schools subsidized by the federal government were major um, I think trajectory tra trajectory changing uh, impacts in my life so I'm, I'm really heartened to see uh, in your plan uh, the intention of restoring furloughed workers uh, when we can, I want to thank you uh, for that. Uh, I expressed to the city manager in our in our one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, my deep concern uh, about uh, programming for the summer. You know, when we talk about um, crime in the city or 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 you know negative things going on in our city, oftentimes what people will say is our kids one need something to do and two need a job. Um, and often for many of our young people in this city, uh, particularly black young people. Um, it's parks and rec during the summer that gives us that something to do to keep our kids occupied. And uh, one of the things that I'm sure folk in the city have noticed that uh, even during the stay at home order, we have not had really uh, a cessation of gunfire uh, in our city. Um, and as we, you know, those of us that know these things know that as the weather gets warmer and we get to the summer months, um, there's more opportunity uh, for things to happen. So that reality combined with uh, COVID impacting programming through Parks and Rec for our kids uh, paints a rather ominous picture for some of us and, and raises concerns uh, for some of us. So, uh, and I shared this with the manager and other colleagues uh, that the the impact that COVID would have on programming during the summer um, is, is is a source of concern for me. So, I, I just want to let you. I want to thank you, firstly, um, in in giving us a picture of of how soon. 
uh, we can open up safely, of course. And I just want to, I guess, not it's not really a question, just a, a note of commendation and just a, uh, an underscoring of how important we realize that that these programs are in Parks and Rec, all of our departments, but Parks and Rec in particular. I don't think there's any more sacred responsibility a government has to its people than to, to protect their lives, first and foremost, keep them alive so they can participate in the economy, so they can enjoy our parks and trails. And I think for, for many in our city uh, who are dealing with issues that will still be there when COVID is over, uh, the safe and comfortable amongst us when we go back to, and I include me in this, when we go back to our normal lives, there will still be some, some things that folk were dealing with before COVID um, and will still be dealing with when COVID passes. And Parks and Rec has been an important part, an important arrow in our quiver uh, to addressing some of those issues. So I just wanna commend you uh, and encourage you to, to, to keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for the work. Um, and for those that are listening that are not elected officials or part of the government, um, particularly I'm, I'm looking at my colleagues in the faith community around the city, there may be some, some stop gap measures or fill in the gap measures that we need to be doing this summer uh, that we need to be thinking about with our facilities, with our resources um, to fill in some of the gaps uh, that may exist uh, because of COVID uh, on city services to, uh, to keep our kids alive and to give them something to do um, while the jobs are being worked on, while our shared economic prosperity plan is, is being put together and those jobs come online down the years. Right now, we gotta keep our kids alive and give them something to do. Um, so kudos to Parks and Rec. Thank you so much uh, for your leadership. And uh, I look forward to uh, working with you uh, through these challenging times. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, council member. Uh, are there other questions or comments from council members? I have a question. Mayor Shore. Thank you. I wanna thank Joy. Joy, uh, I bet you didn't think this was gonna happen when you became interim <laughs> director. Uh, it wasn't in the works. <laughs> wow. Well, and I would point out it was a, it to... was about 45 days later. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joy, thank you for stepping up to it. Um, we're lucky to have you, um, and we appreciate you for stepping into the gap. Um, I thought that uh, Councilmember Middleton made a lot of good points, and I know we're all concerned about the same thing. Uh, and as the summer gets hot and kids have less to do, so I know it's a big concern. And so I appreciate you all thinking about everything you can do to open things up. Um, the, I've had, I've had a, a couple of emails about concerns about opening up the city lakes. When we open up the city lakes, how does that work? Like how, what are the, how are people, What's the social distancing like and, and, and what are the steps in that? Um, well, we've started very um, slow um, actually with our opening of city lakes. At this point, um, we're only allowing bank fishing um, and allowing uh, some the self-launch boats uh, with Lake Mickey. Um, and the reason for starting that out slow is because of, we wanted to ensure that we weren't creating um, issues with social distancing. Um, we set up the, um, the only transactions that occur, one, we're, we're providing uh, these services at no additional cost to uh, participants. Um, because of the demand, um, we have uh, staff have very creatively uh, created a method in which they do a lottery system where folks wishing to come out and, and participate um, text in uh, the day before they want to come out. Um, they're chosen at random. Um, the staff have markers uh, along the bank for the bank fishing to promote the social distancing. They have signage up promoting uh, wearing masks um, and maintaining that distance. Um, we also, um, general services worked with us. Uh, we, uh, instead of, uh, for example, instead of using the small boat houses to conduct that transaction, uh, they set up tables in a pop-up tent outside um, and so that they can maintain the distances with the, um, the participants check-in. Um, general services work with us. We have uh, plexiglass shields to um, shield the, at that point of transaction as well. Um, and that's really just the issue to come in and collect the person's name so we know who is on the lake. Um, so again, we started out very slow. 
Um, we're working now through our risk procedures for how we can modify some things to allow for the non-motorized boat rentals. Um, the, one of the things that we do, for example, with our boat rentals is with the personal flotation devices, our, our staff do checks to make sure they're on uh, correctly and securely. And because of that close contact, we did not start that initially um, because we're reviewing uh, how that is done um, and how it can be done safely. And so we're very, very much aware of every step and we're really analyzing the procedure itself um, and doing what we can to um, minimize the points of contact, and reduce the points of contact um, where possible. Roy, thank you. That was a fantastic uh, explanation, and it really illustrates all of the things that you have to do and, and all of your activities. So thank you. That gives me a lot of confidence. Um, the, the outdoor pools, mm -hmm. um, I know that we, I mean, I just think them of them as just anchors in our summer life in Durham, and I know that we they, they, attract, they attract huge crowds and we can't have huge crowds. Um, and um, and I, right now our limit on the number of people that can gather outside is 10 for a mass gathering. And so I, I get why we're, they're closed. I was, so I'm hoping that you all can think creatively about ways in which the pools over the summer could be open in very limited ways to small groups of people. Um, it would have to be, you know, I, I don't even know what it would have to be, you know, but I can imagine, uh, you know, a couple of families in the pool at a time on one end, you know, you'd have a lot of demand. It would be really hard to manage. But I just, uh, you know, I think it would be good to look at what other pools around the city are going to be doing that are starting out this summer. Um, I know you've got them scheduled to reopen for 2021, uh, but I hope that you can think creatively about a way to maybe make some of that happen this summer. Um, I don't know that that will be possible, but I just want to ask you not to shut the door to that. Um, I, I, I don't want to pretend to know how. Um, and I, I recognize it would create lots of issues because a lot of people would want to do it and you have to have a a lottery system or something like that, but please give that some thought. And, and, and Mr. Mayor, I would say too, uh, we're in contact with all the other, you know, large cities. I can you yeah. know, contact with them every every week. And I think we're pretty consistent uh, with the realities of pools right now. Um, you know, Greensboro, Raleigh, um, Winston-Salem, Charlotte, we're, we're all trying to think through that, but you've outlined many of the, the complications and some, yeah. some impracticalities, because, particularly in those high demand uh, uh, areas, uh, whether it's what happens in the pools, but also what happens at the gate for people who are waiting to get to the pools. And it's, yeah, uh, understood. It, it's very, very challenging, but we're I gonna agree. continue to look at that. But uh, I don't know anybody who's, who's really come up with a solution yet, but I think Joy and her staff, if there is one to be found, I'm pretty confident they'll find one. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Manager. And I uh, just wanted to um, say I've been using the trails relentlessly um, in the last few weeks, uh, walking, biking, um, and when my Achilles will let me, running. Uh, and it's such a gift to our community to have these trails. It's so important. I don't think I've ever seen so much appreciation among our residents for our parks and our trails, and especially our trails at this time, Joy. Um, I want to say that the American Tobacco Trail is very crowded. Um, I, I hear some complaints that people say that people aren't trying to socially distance. My experience is that most people really are, and there's a big effort made. But we also have a lot of trails for people who are concerned about that that aren't as crowded. Uh, Third Fork Creek Trail, uh, Ellaby Creek Trail, mm -hmm especially uh, Elby Tree Creek Trail West Extension um, and others of our trails which don't have the crowding. And I just hope that we can uh, push out to our, to our social media and other things to our residents 
the knowledge of these other trails. It's a great opportunity for us to help people understand how awesome our trails are. Uh, and everybody thinks about the American Tobacco Trail, but we have so much more. So um, I want to thank you for, I want to thank you and the department and um, you know, uh, general services also and, and everybody that makes these uh, trails work so well and uh, are such an incredible asset. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Joy, uh, I wanted to pile on your head many of the same types of praise that I uh, reserved for uh, Gina at General Services uh, a few minutes ago. Um, you have really stepped into the breach, and um, and I don't think I think very few people could have expected um, our Parks Department to to have responded much better uh, than y'all have done during this incredibly difficult time. You know, Parks and Rec is one of those areas where the rubber really hits the road um, with a communicable disease uh, like COVID-19. And our response has been so good and uh, much of the credit belongs to you and your team. So thank you for that. Um, wanted to ask a specific question mm -hmm. around um, the city's baseball facilities um, as it relates to the Durham Long Ball Program as well as uh, South Durham Little League and find out if, if you've been able to make any progress in determining if and when uh, those groups will be allowed to have access to the city's baseball facilities. Um, we're actually discussing that this week. Um, again, um, on Friday, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services um, released additional guidelines on sports and administration of sports. Um, and those guidelines, um, while still very um, stringent, if you will, um, on the provision of baseball and softball, um, we are taking a look at them and seeing whether or not um, we can do anything uh, or we feel we can possibly do something with that safely. Um, and so that is very new, um, sort of off the press with the latest release on guidelines. And so again, we're in communication this week and hoping uh, to work through um, some of those requests that we have pending um, from some of our uh, local athletic organizations. I appreciate that. It's my understanding um, that long ball has gone ahead and canceled their season. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's solely as a result of the their inability to access uh, the city's baseball facilities. I think there's some other considerations there, but I know that's a huge loss for our community. Um, the South Durham Little League is the other organization that I think is working hard to try to create um, a set of procedures that will let them operate safely. Mm -hmm. You know, Bull City Little League is in a different situation because they own their uh, facility in North Durham. And so um, as someone who lives and works in South Durham and who has heard from a number of, of parents and folks affiliated with South Durham Little League, I just wanted to put that bug in your ear that um, that this is that if if there's a way to do it safely, um, I think it'd be really great. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions from members of the Council? Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the presentation and I commend the response on the public health side um, overwhelmingly. I I really wanted to just raise. Um, in addition to the comments that um, Council Member Middleton made, uh, that it is unsettling to think about what the summer will look like um, in East Durham and other parts of, the, of Durham um, without activities. And I also wanted to make sure that I noted, um, so when I was looking at the numbers, I was just trying to figure out exactly how much staff was actually because i'm looking at the chart that shows the staff into the future and it shows 78 as the number of part-time staff moving forward and i wasn't sure if it was because there were seasonal part like part-time workers that you just didn't bring on or if there were actually 147 or 146 part-time workers you had to let go or put on furlough and I wasn't sure if there were, like if there's a continuation, like an overlap or like an open, like if there's folks who just work for the summer and then they come back in the next summer, 
Are those folks able to come back? How does that all look? Um, it's a little bit of a combined um, problem, if you will. The, um, the 146 that were furloughed um, were from those that typically work uh, year round. Um, we had just started um, our summer hiring process um, in which we do bring on typically an additional 100 to 150 um, seasonal staff. And, and so we um, immediately, you know, we stopped hiring um, knowing that our, our programs were going to, to be dramatically impacted initially. Um, and so um, the reason why we didn't make an adjustment to the wrap table and the number shown there for the part-time uh, full-time equivalents is what they are, um, is because of the loss of the summer staff um, and the, and the full-time, I mean, in the year-round part-time that, that we were losing there for July and August. So it's hard, it's hard to really see, I guess, like a clear picture um, outside of the numbers that um, Ms. Youngblood actually shared earlier, where she said that uh, 78 or 76% of those furloughed were black. And of that, I'm figuring around 78% of those from Parks and Rec. And if that is the case, how do you, I guess I'm trying to understand when you're looking at um, how you come how, how you come up with the solutions beyond the public safety aspect, the actual like equity issue that raises up for me is just how many people are at the margins as staff. And if we don't account for that at all, uh, there's there's just a an unsettling feeling about it. So I, I hear the mayor when he says opening up the pools. Um, I, I acknowledge that soccer and basketball might not happen this summer, but we know usually who plays soccer and basketball is uh, black and brown children and people in the community. And I just don't want the same sentiment to go to come across with staff. And so I'm just trying to. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is something that you overlook or something that you know that. That you've intentionally done it's all it's almost as if it's it's the inevitable it's going to happen and i'm trying to push on how we how we stem it and so i'm, I'm not i'm not sure what that looks like but i know that if the positions are are all year-round positions that are furloughed and you're only showing like 206 and the next fiscal year budget, but the with the additional 146, that would be 362. I'm trying to I'm trying to wrap my head around what the logic is and how that unpacks across the year. Uh, because phase three and four aren't going to be where you bring in 146 new people. Okay, the um, the part time number that's showing on the wrap table, the seventy eight, yes. is, is um, that's a calculation that's done to determine the full time equivalency of all of the part time hours. Basically, two thousand what is two thousand eighty hours is a full time uh, equivalent position, and so when we talk about the one hundred and forty six part time staff, those are staff, and I'm I'm trying to look at my. My numbers here, but those those staff were averaging somewhere between anywhere between five, most of them averaging anywhere between five and 25 hours a week. And so there was a range. Um, one of the first things that we did in working with human resources on the assignment of COVID leave um, was we had looked back at the past, I think it was six months to determine the average hours that each employee was working per week in order to ensure that the COVID leave was assigned um, equitably across those employees to ensure that they would have sufficient leave to cover what they would normally earn within a week long period. Um, and so again, those 146, even there's 146 um, persons impacted by this, um, again, they their work range was from five to five hours average to 25 hours. Um, but the 78 that you see on the part-time equivalency, and, and in all honesty, we just did not adjust that. We were 
things were moving very quickly um, as we were trying to determine the savings that we would have from not having those staff um, all on board July 1. Um, and just making a projection of what the savings we determined we thought would happen um, because of our delayed uh, opening of our programs and services and our centers. Um, and the ones, the staff that, that had not been furloughed, part-time staff that were not furloughed, um, were basically we had, um, we knew we were going to be opening City Lakes earlier, and so we kept our City Lake part-time staff on board. We knew we had um, some of the first things out would also be our uh, park tours and whatnot. And so our historic interpreters, for example, that worked at the West Pony Eno, we left them on board. They were helping uh, prepare research and modified programs so that we could bring those back online. Um, we had some of our, um, uh, for example, our uh, park gatekeepers that you know, had meaningful work because they were already out in the field and deemed essential to open and close gates um, um, each night for our part, that, that work continued. Um, and so really the ones that we kept on board um, were, were because the work was there for us to keep them employed and it would not impact. They didn't have the reductions um, that um, may have uh, led them to needing to uh, apply for unemployment. Or having reduced benefits. So when you when you're making those judgment calls, mm -hmm. if you could actually factor in racial equity as well as equity, and being equitable around the fact that those folks who are working five additional hours, that could be the difference between being able to pay the rent or not. Yes. Uh, that would be helpful. That's the gist of it. Mm -hmm. So and in, in bringing on any as you look into being more creative about how to engage some of the phase three and phase four, I would encourage you to look at how um, people show up in those spaces um, and how race plays a factor. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, thank you so much, Joy, for your presentation and for all of your hard work and um, in these difficult times. Please pass our appreciation onto your team as well um, for all the work that they're doing to try to keep our parks and trails up and running as much as possible during this time. Thank you. I will, thank you so much. Have a great day. You too, thanks. Uh, and I'm gonna turn the chair responsibility for this meeting over to council member Reese, if he's ready to, ready to rock. I was born ready, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> um, great, uh, so uh, thanks uh, for the presentation so far, they've been great. Next up is the Department of Transportation with their proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year. And uh, Sean Egan, um, our director is, uh, I see him online. Uh, thanks for being here, Sean, and uh, take it away. All right, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Reese um, and members of the City Council. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the work that the Department of Transportation has been doing uh, in response to COVID and how it will impact our uh, work going forward. So uh, we'll walk through a few different uh, items here, our response, uh, our resource allocation tables, and then our uh, proposed budget and some of the impacts of recent changes on the Durham County Transit Plan uh, and on revenues that we received from the North Carolina Department of Transportation. So as we move in, uh, we'll start with our parking. So we ceased our revenue operations in March. Uh, we've been working with uh, the restaurant industry and, um, and our downtown partners to identify on-street zones that can be used uh, where we repurpose what would be metered spaces to uh, pick up and drop off. And um, that's worked really well. Uh, we've uh, adjusted our security presence um, and uh, done some increased uh, cleaning uh, and to uh, improve the, the safety of our um, facilities and uh, common touch areas. Um, and as was described this morning, uh, we furloughed um, our part-time uh, parking ambassador staff. Uh, in transit, uh, we've 
experienced relatively high ridership. We're at about 60% of our normal ridership uh, when other systems um, are down um, in the you know 10 to 20% range. Uh, so um, in March, we implemented uh, an end of service at 9.30 p.m. Uh, and we suspended uh, certain trips. We were operating around 80%. Um, we, at the beginning of May, due to limited staff availability, uh, we were down at about 50% um, of our service with a, a standard Sunday schedule. Um, and we've added uh, service uh, across a series of routes. Um, and that went into effect on May 18th. Uh, and so we're now operating at about 70% uh, of our normally scheduled service. And uh, those service levels are really driven by our staff availability. Uh, so as we've talked about before, uh, staff um, have um, commitments to their families um, and um, have uh, health concerns and uh, concerns about exposure to coronavirus. Uh, and so that's kept uh, certain staff members from uh, being able to uh, report to work as they normally would. Uh, so we are working um, very hard to uh, recruit uh, additional staff. One of the things that uh, we are looking at, for example, is uh, where we had part-time staff who are parking ambassadors, uh, could we uh, offer them part-time opportunities um, in uh, the GoDurham system as a way uh, to bring those furloughed employees um, back into employment and then also um, to address the staff shortages that we're seeing uh, in our transit system. So we're really trying to think uh, comprehensively about these issues and um, how we can, uh, you know, take care of uh, the employees who are impacted by the furloughs uh, and also address our uh, staffing needs uh, for transit. Uh, so we've implemented a 16 passenger limit um, on the vehicles um, and identified uh, uh, identified seats that are um, that should be used. Uh, but we continue to be concerned about crowding and social distancing. Uh, so we're looking at things like uh, having the windows open in the buses as much as possible to increase um, airflow and circulation. And, uh, and any good idea that um, comes along, uh, we're, we're willing to try it as, uh, and, and we're, we're attentive to what our peers are doing and trying to learn um, uh, any steps that we can take to reduce the risk exposure. Uh, to our, our riders and uh, our staff. Uh, our traffic operations team um, has been split into um, A and B schedules, um, and they've been uh, out in the field um, and taking care of uh, uh, traffic signals, signs that are down, uh, and then working to support uh, major uh, projects. Uh, construction and development projects. Uh, one of the things that we're not able to do right now is um, data collection uh, because of the unusual circumstances that uh, we're in right now. Uh, we don't think that data collection in this time would be meaningful for making decisions about uh, traffic operations during um, normal times. Um, and some of our, um, our heavy duty uh, long line pavement, for example, has been um, suspended uh, as we work through the procedures to be able to uh, conduct that work safely. Uh, in terms of our transportation services, uh, most of our uh, planning and engineering uh, staff are uh, maintaining services while working remotely. Uh, we're conducting development review digitally. We're holding uh, our MPO uh, board meetings. There's a technical committee meeting this morning. Those are proceeding uh, virtually. We're seeing some increases um, in uh, service requests from residents. Uh, some uh, of our residents who are observing things at home during the day uh, that they might not have otherwise seen uh, while at their work sites uh, are identifying issues that uh, they're concerned about uh, safety and noise and such. So they're bringing those uh, issues to our attention and we're working to address them. Um, and uh, one of the tools that we would typically use to address those concerns is studies, but those are, uh, as I said, suspended for right now. Uh, so 
as we look ahead to the next fiscal year, uh, we're looking to return uh, parking uh, operations to uh, gates down revenue operations uh, next week on Monday. Uh, we're working with uh, Downtown Durham Inc. on an outdoor dining uh, program that would enable restaurants to set up space uh, on sidewalks and potentially in the uh, in, say parking spaces uh, on the street to uh, be able to have uh, outdoor dining and reduce exposure that way. Um, and we're working on evaluating the, uh, the timing and the appropriate um, market demand for uh, special events and, um, and evening uh, parking ambassador services. And we'll be doing that in consultation with the Renewal and Recovery Task Force. Uh, on Go Durham, by the end of next month, we're looking to get back to that 80% um, uh, service level, uh, but uh, that, that continues to be driven, as I said, by staff availability. Um, and so we're gonna be uh, looking at uh, different types of uh, recruitment campaigns that we can do to try to get uh, more people involved. We know that there are many people who are out of work during this time. Um, and so there's an opportunity for us uh, to uh, provide uh, good paying uh, living wage jobs uh, for people who have been um, economically impacted by this. And so we really want to uh, find ways to match uh, people who um, are looking for work with the, the job opportunities that we have uh, in transit. Uh, one of the steps you'll see on the next slide that we've taken uh, to protect our operators um, is a partition. Uh, so we have these installed in three of our vehicles. Right now, uh, we're working to get them installed across the fleet. Uh, we did a, uh, an initial installation of uh, two and got uh, feedback from the operators. The feedback was very positive uh, that we did receive. So um, they, uh, they see the value and they appreciate uh, the additional protection that is uh, afforded uh, by this barrier. So that's an example of one of the things that uh, you could see uh, with our service that uh, is an improvement uh, for uh, better COVID protection. Uh, in terms of our operations and services for next year, we're looking to get uh, back up to full service levels um, as uh, we can do so safely so we can take on uh, some of those larger projects uh, like the pavement marking projects. Uh, we're looking to resume data collection potentially uh, when schools are back in session, although that uh, is an open question uh, at this point. Um, and we're working through um, community engagement, um, different practices. So we've done some things innovatively like um, we on East Main Street, uh, we were looking at reconfiguring the roadway there. Um, and we had one of our community rooted partners uh, lead uh, a video conference where she walked down the street and talked about different observations about uh, what we liked about um, the way that that roadway was laid out and uh, got feedback from uh, folks uh, about what they, they would like to see, uh, what they like, what they don't like, what they would like to see for. Um, for that East Main Street. So we're trying out different um, approaches and, and really trying to take advantage of uh, the resources that we have with community rooted partners through um, neighborhood improvement services to do that. Uh, with our passenger vehicle program, we would normally do uh, taxi inspections in April. That's, we were working with fleet management to uh, conduct those in August. Um, and our, our Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge is working with um, the uh, budget management services um, on doing uh, analysis of telework, uh, what we're learning from uh, the telework deployment that we've done in the city. Uh, we're doing some uh, surveys uh, and then how we can use that to inform policymaking um, and encourage uh, telework going forward uh, within the city and then uh, throughout our community. Uh, so you'll see on our org chart, um, we have uh, a new structure proposed uh, 
uh, with uh, business services as a new branch reporting to the director with a new business services manager. This is really uh, important for us because of um, the increased uh, financial and administration that goes along with the uh, parking that we've, the parking operation that we insource that had been uh, previously contracted. Uh, we've been relying heavily on uh, our colleagues in the Department of Finance over the last year to provide us with additional support uh, to, to address all of the business services needs uh, of our, our in-house parking operation. And then we're also seeing significant growth in transit uh, with additional resources available through the Durham County Transit Plan. Uh, we're, uh, we have access uh, to uh, additional funding and we wanna make sure that uh, we manage that in a transparent and accountable way. And so uh, having uh, a business services manager and then restructuring um, MPO parking and transit services, uh, we can make sure that we're identifying opportunities to use resources efficiently um, and uh, scale uh, the level of investment that we're making um, in uh, our services. Uh, so the next slide is the um, resource allocation table uh, for our general fund budget. So this has that one additional position, uh, but other than that, um, our uh, general fund uh, positions are uh, are pretty stable. Uh, we're consistent uh, from uh, where we expect to be at the end of this year uh, to what's proposed for next year. And that new position is split across uh, general with support from parking um, and transit as well. Uh, with our transit table, uh, we have, um, we're expecting a significant decrease in revenues uh, from Fairbox. Uh, we suspended um, fare collection in March, and uh, so some of our, uh, and then we're looking um, at reduced support uh, from the State Department of Transportation um, as a potential risk, similar to what uh, was discussed this morning with the Powell Bill. Um, there is support for public transit as well as uh, support for um, sign signal pavement marking operations that. Uh, transportation receives from NCDOT, uh, and we're looking at uh, potential reductions uh, in those sources as well. Uh, what's not included in this table is uh, our federal assistance. Uh, so we were very uh, fortunate through the Federal CARES Act to get um, uh, an allocation of $12 million that was uh, just recently approved um, through a split process by the MPO. Um, and so we're now in a position of uh, working through uh, the FTA process to identify expenses that are uh, eligible for that use, develop the grant and uh, work through that uh, drawdown process. So that, um, that will help us um, as we uh, try to make sure that we're sustaining operations uh, with some of the uh, revenue reductions that we're seeing, we'll still be able to see um, we'll still be able to maintain full um, service levels as staffing permits. Uh, and then for parking, um, we're seeing a significant uh, drop in revenues um, and we're seeing uh, a much higher reliance on um, appropriation from fund balance than um, we had anticipated. And so, you know, when we were um, having this discussion in February, uh, the parking fund uh, looked to be in balance uh, through 20, 21, and 22, um, and then um, would be looking at a, a, a negative balance in 23. Uh, we're now, based on uh, the suspension of revenue collections and reduced demand, uh, we're expecting to see um, a significantly greater reliance on fund balances in both fiscal year 20 and 21, uh, and uh, we uh, do not expect to have uh, significant fund balances available in FY22. So we're going to have to be uh, taking a hard look at uh, the FY22 budget and what we can do uh, 
um, to uh, ensure that the parking fund is in balance in FY22. Uh, so, uh, as I said, Go Durham um, has uh, available $12 million in CARES funding. Uh, we're, we've um, been very successful in advocating for uh, additional resources through the Durham County Transit Plan. Uh, several of those have been approved in the FY20 work plan. Others um, are recommended right now and will be going to the Go Triangle Board for final approval in June. Uh, and just to give you a sense of that, uh, we're uh, seeing an increase of two and a half million uh, for uh, service level increases and 7.8 million for uh, transit emphasis corridor infrastructure and uh, electric bus uh, vehicle purchases. Uh, so that's a uh, really exciting opportunity for us to uh, utilize those resources and improve um, service infrastructure rolling stock for our customers. Um, as we look to the update of the Durham transit plan, uh, we're really, we're trying to think through different ways to approach public outreach. I think there'll be some more discussion tomorrow on public engagement uh, citywide. Um, and so right now we're trying to front load as much as possible the technical work for uh, the, the, the plan. So um, scenarios of uh, service levels, uh, regional connectivity needs, uh, some guidelines, some operations analysis. Um, and then as we work through those uh, technical pieces, we'll have information that we can bring forward uh, for uh, the public to respond to and uh, to get uh, some uh, priorities from as we, as we present these different scenarios, see um, how the public responds to the different scenarios and, and what their uh, priorities and what their feedback is um, as we work through this. Uh, so the project schedule uh, has been modified for the transit plan update. So we're now looking at releasing a draft for comment in the fourth quarter of fiscal year 21 uh, to be followed by adoption by the boards. So uh, as I said, we're, we're front loading more of the uh, technical analysis work uh, in the hope that we can uh, resume some of those public engagement uh, activities later in the cycle. Uh, uh, we've talked a little bit about NCDOT and our funding concerns. Uh, as was described this morning, the um, Powell Bill revenues are expected to be down 25%. Uh, we're seeing uh, reductions in uh, the state aid for public transit, as well as um, sign uh, marking and signal. So we're looking uh, at uh, a $0.8 million loss for uh, sources that are provided directly to uh, transportation. That, that would be in addition to the, uh, the cuts for the Powell Bill. Um, and uh, it's not just direct funding, uh, but we have locally administered projects that require NCDOT approval at each step. Um, so if you look at the next slide, um, when we want to go from design uh, to right away or right away to construction, uh, we need NCDOT to um, approve us advancing those projects. Uh, and right now, the information that we're getting from NCDOT is because of their funding crisis that they're um, not uh, ready to uh, make any of those approvals. So we have a number of projects, about 12 projects that uh, are directly impacted, but uh, as time goes forward, um, even large projects like the um, Durham Beltline uh, trails project um, stand to be significantly impacted by these restrictions. So this is something that we've raised repeatedly through the MPO process, and we're gonna continue to talk about um, how important these projects are for local governments um, and um, that uh, this re there really should be um, a priority as uh, funding is available at NCDOT, uh, that these projects should be uh, prioritized. If we have funding identified and we don't use it, um, it could lead to a loss in um, those federal funds uh, if they're not utilized timely. Uh, and so, we're also uh, 
working with public works and general services on our uh, work plans for the next year and, um, and throughout the CIP to see how these delays uh, will impact their work plans. Uh, and we'd really like uh, to, to get work uh, out on the street right now because of NCDOT's uh, funding crisis uh, and the economic conditions. We think there's uh, really good value in the marketplace. There's capacity that's available. Uh, and so we, we would really like to take advantage of uh, strong competition and, um, and price uh, competition during this time, but uh, without uh, NCDOT's approvals, we're not in a position to proceed. Uh, so uh, those are the major points. Uh, Councilmember Reese, I'm happy to answer um, any questions. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button, but I've got it now. Thank you, Sean. That was uh, really great and detailed. Um, before we get to council questions, can you clarify the business services manager position? I don't, I don't necessarily know what that means. You said some words about it, but sure, maybe it's just so, me. But I didn't really understand some of those words either. So could you, could you give try 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 again sure. on why that position um, is important right now? So we have significant um, financial management needs um, within, the, within the department that are driven by the insourcing of our parking operations. Um, so we have uh, revenue collections, billing, uh, and financial controls uh, needs uh, that we're, we've been relying heavily on um, support from the finance department over the last year to uh, address those needs as we stand up. We stood up the operational aspects of our parking uh, last year when we uh, transitioned from the contract operation uh, to um, the a city administered operation. But much of the um, financial management work that uh, comes along with that that needs to be sustained um, is uh, more than uh, we're in a position to uh, do right now uh, with our current staffing levels. And then uh, as I talked about the growth that we're seeing in uh, funding for services as well as um, infrastructure for transit um, drives uh, a need for us to increase our financial management capacity. Uh, we have significant um, reporting uh, work that we need to do and significant compliance work that we need to do. We have more uh, procurements, more contracts uh, to uh, manage as a result of these uh, additional resources. And so the business services manager in this structure uh, puts us in a position to support these additional financial procurement and other administrative uh, work that uh, is needed to uh, advance these services. John, is there any uh, possibility that CARES funding can support that position because of the additional uh, requirements? So I think um, we can definitely uh, look at that. Right now it's split a third, a third, and a third between general parking and transit. But um, if, uh, because we have these additional transit needs over the next year, um, we could replace the, the general fund contribution with a, a transit fund contribution uh, in the budget. I think uh, we could support that. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. That's, that's an extremely helpful explanation. Um, and let's definitely kind of talk about the source of funding for that position. I want to open it up to my colleagues. If anybody has questions, if you'll just raise your hand. I didn't see anybody jumping into the chat. So, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Council Member, and thank you, Sean. Um, we've seemed like we got all the new directors up today. Figure we'd torture them early, I guess, Tom, right? Um, we really appreciate you. Um, and you've also just really done a great job taking hold of all the various, it's such a, the department has so much variety. I don't know if we have any other department, maybe a couple, but that have the variety that you do. Um, I, I wanna thank you for the support for the outdoor dining uh, downtown. I've heard a lot of great uh, compliments from the folks from Downtown Durham Incorporated uh, and others about uh, 
uh, Thomas Leathers and other people in your department have been working with them to try to make the downtown uh, outdoor dining work. And I'm excited about that. I think that's great. I know there are a lot of issues to be worked through, but want to appreciate that. We, we really need to make that happen if we can. And so thank you so much. Um, the, a, a couple of questions, the, oh yeah, one other, one other thing before my questions, and I want to applaud your leadership on the, uh, the way the transit plan has turned out, the county transit plan. I know you really did a great job advocating for the, uh, the transit emphasis corridors uh, and our capital needs, and uh, it's really great to see and I want to thank our county commission colleagues and the Go Triangle staff and board and uh, and and uh, for for supporting that. But uh, especially to you, Sean, for having a great plan in place and it's getting funded. It's a big advance to, especially for our transit riders. It's huge. Um, so you've we've we've received a lot of comment and uh, about the idea at this time of trying to create what our bicycle and pedestrian advocates are calls, call it, causing, calling slow streets. Uh, that's one of my questions. I wanted to know if you could comment on that. Um, well, why don't you start with that? I have just a couple others that I guess are kind of unrelated to that. Sure, so um, I've had some good discussions with um, advocates uh, at Bike Durham, for example, and I've read a lot of the um, requests that we've gotten from citizens. And uh, we're really um, interested in um, advancing uh, a slow streets program here, but we really want it to be done um, in a way that engages the communities uh, where this would be implemented. So right now we're working at um, developing information that we can use for outreach to uh, the communities and neighbors um, who would be um, directly impacted by this and try to build um, understanding and build support for the slow streets concept um, so that when it's implemented, it can be sustained. Uh, and there's an understanding of well, why it's important, um, how it improves safety, um, and that it's going to, it's going to change uh, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and we want to make sure that uh, people are uh, prepared for that and that if they have concerns uh, that we've address those. So we're working on that outreach piece right now. Um, and once we've identified, and we also think there's a role for um, neighborhoods to uh, help us with some of the quality control issues to be our eyes and ears um, in many uh, respects. Uh, and that's one of the comments that we've gotten from the uh, advocacy community is that um, the neighbors are, are ready to play that role. And so we, we want to, um, enlist people to help us if there's a sign that's twisted or uh, something that's fallen down that um, they'll let us know um, and we can deploy resources uh, to take care of that whereas if we had to do all of the monitoring and uh, quality control with uh, our resources um, we wouldn't uh, be able to sustain that so that's part of what we're trying to do is make sure that this is something that's a community-led um, initiative uh, and it's, that has strong support in the community um, and that it's, it's deployed in those places uh, where we have good community support. Uh, but we think there's a lot of value in uh, taking uh, streets that were identified in our uh, Durham Walks plan, um, as well as our um, Bike and Walk plan um, and uh, using those where we've already uh, gotten uh, public input that those are good places uh, for uh, walking and bicycling, uh, that we build upon that framework uh, and uh, implement some measures uh, that can uh, help us uh, slow streets and improve safety in those areas. But we really do want it to be a community-led initiative. I think that's a fantastic approach. I really appreciate that. And I also think that will help us with the equity as our, as our program goes forward. So thank you. Um, the I've heard, uh, I had a uh, discussion, uh, a Zoom discussion with a uh, paratransit employee who was concerned about the safety of their PPE. Um, and 
Uh, can you talk about that or, or our, how do we feel about the quality of the PPE that we have for our, for our transit employees? So uh, we've uh, been working through the PPE availability, availability issues for the last uh, you know, two months um, during this event. Um, and I think we're, we're now at a point where, we're, uh, where we feel like we have adequate um, PPE uh, for our paratransit staff. Uh, you know, the nature of the paratransit service is that uh, there's closer interaction between um, our riders and our staff. Um, and so uh, we really want to make sure that we're doing uh, everything that we can to um, make PPE available, not only to our um, operators, um, but also um, to the extent that it's um, medically feasible uh, to our riders uh, so that they can, um, you know, protect each other uh, through this. So that's one of the things that we're uh, working through right now is, um, is the availability of um, masks and face coverings uh, where we can make them available to uh, paratransit riders. Uh, so that provides an additional layer of protection for our operation staff. Uh, but I'd be happy to look into um, any specific questions or concerns. Thank you very much. And then the, my, my last question uh, is, do, do you know, what is your sense of the percentage, you know, a, a range or a, a good estimate or a guess would be fine here, Sean? Um, in terms of our people riding our transit system, the fixed routes, uh, what would you say the, the, the percentage of people who are, who, are, who are wearing a face covering is? And what do you, how would you go about quantifying the need um, of, for face coverings for our transit riders that are not covering um, just thinking about, you know, one of the things we're trying to think about is what is our total kind of community need going forward for face coverings? And one of our, you know, real vulnerable populations, of course, is our transit riders. So do you have any thoughts to offer on that? So um, I can say that we've had regular discussions uh, with some of the nonprofit groups that have been making um, masks and other face coverings available to our riders, Echo Durham uh, Station. And, um, that's something that we're really uh, we're pleased that the, the community is stepping forward. I was also really glad to see um, at the work session last week the discussion of the, the county-led effort uh, to make additional um, face coverings available and, uh, and your advocacy, Mr. Mayor, for making sure that those uh, become available to uh, our transit riders. Uh, right now, we're seeing a relatively low uh, adoption of uh, masks and face coverings. Um, so uh, I've heard in some cases less than half, in other cases maybe 10% uh, of our riders are um, are using masks or other face coverings. So I think the availability of um, the face coverings is really important, but then also um, supporting that with the right um, information for our customers. So we've been doing onboard announcements, for example, uh, letting people know uh, how important it is to wear face coverings. Um, we've also done some um, videos with our uh, operations staff talking about how um, important it is that uh, we use uh, masks and face coverings to protect each other. But uh, we're very um, aware that uh, we're not um, having as strong uh, of adoption of that as we would like to see. And I, I think availability um, is one piece of it, um, but also that educational piece is going to be really important, making sure people understand that, um, you know, this is a service that we share together um, and that our continued um, ability to share it relies on us um, looking out for each other uh, and wearing masks to protect um, each other. So that's part of the um, effort that we're still trying to work through uh, from the communications front. We have a new uh, communication staff person at Go Durham who just started uh, last week, so that's been kind of top of the uh, order for uh, for that work is is trying to increase that um, that education to go along with the availability of equipment. 
Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reese, and thank you, Sean. Uh, who else? Uh, Council Member Middleton, go right ahead. Thank you, Chairman Reese. Um, and thank you, Sean. I um, appreciate you uh, being here. I want to say that I, I really am um, uh, not only impressed with the um, incredible amount of experience and skill set you brought to your, your job, but your temperament as well. And, and we've been becoming quite good friends as uh, we've, you've been helping me address a number of constituent uh, concerned around the city. So I want to thank you for your, your patience with me and your partnership with me uh, in those matters. Um, the mayor already asked one of my two questions, so this will be really short. Uh, and I want to thank the mayor for bringing up the face mask issue and, and how good our penetration was in terms of riders riding them. I did want to ask also about uh, any uh, sanitation protocols uh, that we're employing when our buses are offline, uh, if any at all, if, if you had any uh, insight into that. Sure. So we've increased um, our sanitation protocols. Uh, one of the biggest steps that we've taken um, is the deployment of uh, a disinfecting fogger. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, when the bus returns to the depot, um, it uh, has a disinfecting fogger that, um, that coats uh, every surface uh, on the vehicle. Um, and that's been uh, a, a new uh, step that we've implemented this year, or uh, this since um, COVID, since March, uh, in order to uh, try to reach uh, some surfaces that uh, wouldn't uh, be, be reached with a, a typical cleaning. Um, but we've also increased um, our uh, cleaning frequency uh, and then also uh, stepped up. So at, at Durham Station, for example, uh, we have now um, hourly cleanings of our um, our most frequently touched surfaces like doorknobs and uh, elevators and such. So uh, we're working um, and uh, there's more information about that available at um, Go Durham Transit. Um, so we're working to address needs um, in our fleet uh, as well as in our facilities uh, to uh, try to protect our, our riders and our staff. Do you know if that applies also to our paratransit vehicles or any supplemental vehicles we're employing? Yeah, my understanding is that we're using the foggers for the paratransit vehicles as well. All right. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Middleton. Councilmember Freeman, I believe you're next in line. Thank you. I uh, am grateful that uh, the mayor actually asked me a couple of my questions as well. And I just wanted to share the comment that I really appreciate your community focus um, and doing the, some of the outreach. I know we had this conversation at, at one of the council presentations and it looks like you've you've tucking, taken the bull by the horns and you're definitely digging in on making sure you're engaging the community rooted partners. And there was one other thing I noted. And uh, just, just a, a, a question of regarding the insourcing on the parking. I just want to make sure that we're so there, there were a number of, there were like a very small number of of uh, staff that came in from the parking insourcing and I just want to make sure that I note that, that staff is uh, very valuable and I appreciate you making sure that they they return as soon as as quickly as possible yeah we're very focused on finding um, the right ways to um, Bring, bring people back who have provided really strong uh, customer service uh, and service to the city. And, um, and so uh, what steps we can take um, to bring those, uh, those team members back um, in their original capacity or in some other capacity, uh, but make sure that we, we take advantage of um, their availability and their, their um, knowledge and uh, skills going Thank forward. Any other members have any questions for Sean before I uh, start to dig in? Awesome. Uh, hi, Sean. Hi, how are you? Um, I, I was really excited when I saw that um, you were going to be chairing this um, session. <laughs> Sean, so I, I thought I might that. get off easy, but um, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> Sean, I think one of the things that uh, that is the responsibility of the chair is to make sure other folks are, are heard before I then step up and step suck up. the rest of the oxygen out of the room. Um, so, uh, Sean, uh, I think it's fair to say that I've probably spent more time 
talking and working with you since you started as a department head than any other department head in the city. And I say that to make sure folks know that uh, that I have really come to respect and appreciate your incredibly straightforward brand of leadership. Um, there's I've never been in a meeting with you where I didn't know exactly what you thought about a particular thing and uh, didn't know how you thought we ought to uh, move forward with it. And that is uh, that is amazing and the kind of leadership that I think we need more of um, uh, everywhere in our country. Um, I think one of the I've, I've got a, a couple of sets of questions, but maybe my biggest question is about the parking fund. Um, as you pointed out, um, over the next, over this year and the upcoming fiscal year, we're looking to use something in the neighborhood of $7.2 million out of fund balance to keep the parking fund solvent. Um, you addressed in your presentation the need to really bear down on uh, parking operations uh, as we move through this fiscal year and planning for the next fiscal year. But I wonder if you could give me just a little bit more color about what that might look like. You know, the, 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 market for parking downtown has gone really whipsawed over the last three years, really two years. Um, at the same time, we brought our new parking deck online, a number of other facilities came online and were undercutting us on price. Now there's no demand, um, no telling when demand is going to come back. It's of all the departments in the city, this one seems one of the most, um, I guess, up in the air in terms of how how we're going to get back to some something approaching normal. So I wonder if you could just spend a couple minutes talking about kind of over the next 12 to 18 months, what 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 can be done um, about parking operations? Sure. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this in February um, that uh, we're very focused on making the parking fund um, self-sustaining. Uh, and there are steps that we can take to do that, um, but we're going to have to take steps uh, on the expenditure side, um, on the revenue side, um, and then also uh, with our uh, capital improvements. So um, on the expenditure side, uh, I talked a little bit about how we've been right-sizing uh, our security staffing. So we have contracted security for our um, facilities uh, right now uh, for our five major facilities. It's um, it's um, 24 hour service. Uh, and what we've, uh, identified is that because of the proximity of many of our facilities, uh, and we've, um, and the levels of activity that we're seeing that we can, uh, reduce, uh, that contracted, uh, staffing, um, and provide a zone coverage, uh, that reduces our, our security costs. Uh, there, there continue to be concerns from uh, some of the downtown businesses about um, security, but we think that um, by having more of a zone coverage model, we can uh, maintain uh, security uh, and uh, also right-size our expenses. Uh, on the revenue side, we've also got uh, proposed changes where we'd be increasing our hourly uh, parking fees by 25 cents um, in fiscal year 21. And then we'd be coming to increase our um, monthly parking fees in fiscal year 22. Uh, so, uh, and that's part of a, a regular schedule where each year we, uh, we increase either the uh, hourly or the monthly. But as you said, the, the market has changed uh, pretty dramatically for us. Um, so we'll have to see um, what, uh, impact uh, that has, uh, but we think that uh, setting the price of parking um, is very important um, and it helps us to recover our costs um, and it also helps us to uh, encourage uh, other forms of uh, transportation like uh, our bus system. So, and then the other piece that we're looking at is the timing of uh, major capital improvements. Uh, to our um, facilities and what's um, sustainable uh, for us for major projects like uh, uh, wayfinding um, that has been uh, postponed uh, from our work plan for this fiscal year and, and uh, 
what are some of these um, major initiatives that um, we would like to do. We think there's value in doing, um, but we have to make sure that um, we have the resources uh, to be able to do that project and, um, and uh, also keep our um, facilities in a state of good repair and address uh, safety and uh, customer service needs. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, I think we need to focus, uh, if we just focus on expenses or revenues or capital, uh, no one of those is going to uh, solve this problem for us. But I think um, looking across the board at all three of those and, and understanding um, the uh, market forces at work here uh, that uh, we, can, we can work through and, and develop uh, some uh, scenarios and solutions uh, to carry us forward. Appreciate that. As I've said before on the revenue side, I, I think it's, it's a, a frustrating challenge um, because you've got major commercial competitors who are undercutting us on price. So, you know, in, uh, strategies to increase um, parking charges might not necessarily have the revenue impact we're looking for, but that's why they pay you the big bucks is to to, to come up with solution to all the annoying uh, problems that I that I come up with, um, the with respect to um, outdoor dining, I think one of the things that I've been really interested in is looking at Charlotte's temporary outdoor dining program uh, and the allocation of um, a certain percentage of restaurants dedicated parking spaces. I think downtown that's not really a model that works given kind of what we what the setup downtown. And I really appreciate you working with downtown businesses and restaurants who many of the restaurants are kind of surviving to the extent they are on uh, the drive up um, takeout service and the city's quick uh, response at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis to open up our on street parking program to that kind of drive up uh, pickup has been was really fantastic. And I, I've shared that with folks actually around the country. Uh, as kind of a model for what might happen. So I appreciated that, appreciate your work with them. But I think in terms of outside the downtown core, I think we might think about um, looking at Charlotte's program. I'm not sure that's necessarily a transportation issue. So maybe this is more directed at the city manager to have folks take a look at um, at what Charlotte has done and kind of the, the little, the, the program that they've developed and see if something like that might work for us outside of the downtown core. Um, the only other question I had was, oh, to appreciate your uh, conversations with um, cycling and pedestrian advocates around slow streets. Um, you know, we've, the city and our community has done a lot of work around identifying um, uh, streets in Durham that are good candidates for whatever we wanted to call them. At one point they were bike boulevards and there's lots of other incarnations of that. Um, but I think those are great candidates um, to move forward with uh, with the participation of our community partners, and I appreciate your uh, growing partnership with them as they, as we try to m make that work. Um, I think, uh, as the mayor said when we we're in the in the DPR conversation, I haven't seen a huge uh, I haven't seen huge crowds um, on. Uh, on sidewalks and streets and whatnot, but I know that there are places where that is happening. And I think whatever we can do to create new spaces for folks, you know, one of the things that I've been floored by is that when the governor opened up our state parks, I wanna say a week and a half ago, maybe, they are still, I mean, they are just jam packed. Um, and I get these notifications periodically from the state parks department that tells me when the parking lots at various state parks get to capacity. And they're often at like 9 a.m., 9.30 a.m. Just, I think that just points to the desire that folks have to be out and about. Um, and I think we all know that, that transmission risks are much lower for uh, the coronavirus uh, in outdoor settings, although not completely eliminated. So all that is, is by way of saying thank you for keeping those, for having those conversations and would love to hear more about what happens with that as we move forward. And again, those don't have to be big permanent installations. We've even seen a community do a kind of a renegade uh, rogue uh, street slowdown um, that I went and uh, walked through and took pictures of uh, a couple, three weeks ago, um, not necessarily recommending that as, a, as something that 
more neighborhoods ought to do, but more pointing out that these don't have to be be expensive permanent installations, that we can do some things pretty cheaply and quickly that really increase uh, folks' quality of life in some of our neighborhoods. So just wanted to keep your, uh, make a plug for that as well. Um, and just, oh, just wanted to echo what the mayor said about your success in advocating for new funding through the Durham County Transit Fund. You know, that's been something that you and I have been working on for a while. Really happy to see that get through the MPO vote, I guess it was last week. Um, and looking forward to seeing those projects move forward. Uh, really appreciate your vision, especially on um, the corridor improvements to making sure that transit can move more smoothly, uh, more on time service. That's really important. All, and also, thanks for ratcheting up service levels whenever we can when we have the staffing for it. Because obviously, um, as you said, we have our ridership has gone down much less than really any other jurisdiction that I've heard about. Um, and keeping that service up and running is really important. Um, okay, that's uh, did uh, so. Thanks. Did did my rambling trigger any more questions with my colleagues? I know it may have triggered some boredom, but uh, but maybe maybe questions. Ah, Councilmember Freeman, go right ahead. Thank you. I I would say that I I'm in the same boat usually with the rambling sometimes. So uh, I just wanted to note that I'm I'm excited. I know that the fines and fees work will touch on some of that parking. I hope, and I'm looking forward to having some conversations about what it looks like to really bring into the fold, you know fines and fees, actual justice around it, so that the disparities that always show up don't, aren't as, uh, as large, I'm sorry. And um, just along, that, along those lines, I just wanted to make sure that I, I did restate or clarify, I know I was rambling with Parks and Rec around the issue. I just wanted to note that I, as, as a value-centered leader, it's hard for me to, to express those values in words sometimes. And I'm just trying to make sure that, that I that I impose the the kind of support that encourages all of our staff to be very creative and imaginative imaginative around how to address race equity. Because as a person of color, over the last couple of weeks, it's been really hard, just leaving it at that, to even understand how we don't see a problem with the way that things work. And so I just encourage you to please continue to surprise me. Please continue to push and make those um, just, I mean, I've seen staff, staff has presented some of the most phenomenal ideas around, you know, being more equitable over the last three years that I've been on council and I can imagine longer, but I, I, I I really just need more out of, out of, out of this, this process because I can't do a Katrina outcome. And I know what it looks like when we, when we look at what's easy and we look at, and we rush to, to, to make decisions around cost cutting. And I don't want to see that out of Durham. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. I would just say, you know, the biggest increase in our budget um, is in um, investments in our go Durham transit service and infrastructure. And we know that in terms of uh, equitable uh, investment of resources uh, that uh, we have, um, you know, uh, approximately 90% of our riders are people of color. Um, and so when we talk about racial equity and how we can direct resources and make investments um, that disproportionately benefit um, communities of color, that um, the types of investments that we're able to make and the big increases that you're seeing uh, in investments in uh, transit service and infrastructure are uh, disproportionately uh, benefiting communities of color. And we're gonna continue um, to advocate uh, for even more and greater resources uh, for our local transit service uh, and infrastructure uh, along those lines and as, as, a, as the, the really, uh, a really, uh, focused way to um, address the um, equity needs and, and to share the economic prosperity of our community. Sean, is that one of your staff people in the background upset with some of your leadership skills? I can't uh, can't tell what that noise is. One of your coworkers. Are, yeah, I'm. I think it's Cora, my daughter. She's a little um, out of sorts right now. I don't think she wants to go down for her nap. Yeah, I uh, I know the feeling. Um, 
so if uh, does anybody else have any questions or comments for Sean on transportation? Speak now or forever hold your peas. Okay, Sean, Sean, again, uh, just thank you so much for everything that you've done in your short time with us, um, especially as it, as it surrounds Go Durham and making sure our transit service is up and running to the maximum extent possible right now. It's so important and just appreciate your leadership on that and everything else. And I just want to just take a moment to thank the team. Um, we talked about um, the great work that Thomas Leathers has been doing. Uh, Bill Judge, my assistant director, uh, has been doing outstanding work and has really been a critical part of, um, of uh, the work uh, to prepare this presentation for today uh, to help me uh, get up to speed and address the many uh, complex issues uh, that we have here. So we have an incredibly uh, strong team um, and really strong partners at the MPO, um, Echo Triangle uh, with the county, uh, and we're working together, but um, I certainly couldn't do it uh, without the strong support um, of the team and the partners. So I just wanted to say a word of thanks. Uh, great. Um, thank you, Sean, again. Do, is that the end of our uh, presentations right now, Mr. Yes, Manager? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Bertha. That's correct. Um, so can you kind of set the table about what's next for us, Tom? Uh, I'll try and certainly want to uh, take this opportunity to thank you all for great questions and uh, interjecting some ideas to us. Uh, also, I thought the staff presentations today from top to bottom were, were terrific for a format that was new to us all, but I, I hope you can get a sense of just how engaged uh, all of our staff is in so many of these challenging issues in terms of uh, COVID response and, and recovery. So uh, I just wanna congratulate and thank you, uh, thank the staff. Um, one thing that uh, we traditionally do with these sessions that we didn't really focus on this morning, uh, but want to come back to uh, certainly give the mayor a chance to talk, but any, uh, uh, make sure that we know what are the flagged items that you feel for what you heard today uh, need additional uh, follow-up and, and conversation. Uh, in the past, we have held uh, time uh, on the work session after the public hearing uh, or, or prior to the work session uh, after the public hearing for kind of final budget check-in and reviewing flagged items. So I think it would be helpful, Mr. Mayor, if uh, any council members uh, have particular items that uh, they heard today that either are unsettled or, uh, or need more information. If we could take just a few minutes and get any recap from council members about those, we'd be sure and capture those. All righty, thank you. And I wanna thank uh, council member Reese and Mayor Pro Tem for presiding so well, I appreciate it. You know, it's interesting, I, I find presiding over these Zoom meetings more taxing than presiding over regular meetings maybe because I'm always having to constantly arrange my face because I feel like there are people watching me from all over. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what it is. But anyway, so it's gonna have to be a group effort, you guys. And I appreciate everybody pitching in and all the coll all my colleagues for great questions. Uh, I especially want to thank uh, Council Member Freeman for her you know, putting forward these important equity issues today. Um, they're important all the time and they're important to all of us, but uh, we really, you know, um, I think the, it's just so important to be having these constant challenges and reminders. So council member Freeman, thank you for that. It's much appreciated. Um, and, and Mr. Mayor, if I could mention just real quick, I apologize to interrupt, but I mean, yeah, no, hey, go ahead. Uh, we, we haven't spent a lot of time with the council uh, talking through the work that we are doing with the, uh, you know, kind of reestablishing city services and, and the service level adjustments. You heard some of that today. Uh, but we have uh, integrated in every aspect of that a, uh, the folks from our equity inclusion department helping us and be sure that we are thinking about those equity issues as well. Sometimes they don't always come across as maybe as clear and articulate as, as we know we're working on them, but rest assured uh, every aspect of us thinking about COVID response and in particular uh, service restoration uh, doesn't happen without some uh, equity lens approach as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Manager. Colleagues, uh, the manager has asked us to think about any items that we have flagged for further consideration uh, on the budget front. Um, and I'll just open uh, the floor. Is there, and, and Mr. Manager, do you have anything that you heard that you think is, I'll start with you, anything that you heard that you feel like we need to take up? 
Well, I think there were some some questions in in Parks and Recreation potentially that uh, uh, council members had questions about staffing. Uh, hopefully, we've clarified those. Uh, also, I think uh, there was a question about additional staffing and uh, around the uh, the transportation uh, financial manager picture. I I think those were answered, but if they if they weren't or they need more 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 discussion, uh, I think we'd like to know that. Uh, those were two that jumped out at me. Bertha, do you have any other notes of things in particular that you've flagged? Um, I do not. That were not that I don't feel that were answered during the discussions. Yeah. No. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to continue to talk about the additional position in transportation. I think that. Um, Sean made a strong case for why that position is important, but I'd like the opportunity to weigh that against all the other um, potential needs in the city as that's a new position and we um, have talked about other possibilities for spending that money. So I'd like to put that on the on the list for follow up. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Reese. Mr. Mayor, I just want to follow up and um, second what what the mayor pro tem said, but also point out that Sean, um, I think, proposed to shift the funding source of that from the general fund uh, to I think it was transit, and that would certainly help me um, when it comes to that particular position. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Thank you, Councilmember Caballero. And that some of that could come potentially from CARES, the CARES money, correct? correct. And not just from the general fund, that that distribution, because it was a third, a third, and a third, and that distribution could be reevaluated moving forward? Correct. Thank you. I have um the transportation, my transportation questions were answered. Uh, I do want to know a little bit more around the, uh, um, with Parks and Rec, just kind of the breakdown, because it was really helpful to hear that explanation of, of the part-time workers being from anywhere to from five to 25 hours. And just to understand more, I guess, percentages of, of how many folks were at 25 hours versus five hours. Um, so and that can be provided in an email, but just more of those work, workforce statistics would be super helpful. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Others? Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, let me add my thanks to uh, Charlie Gillian for a great job on uh, presiding today over their respective parts of the uh, agenda. Strong team, strong team we got. Um, I did want to just um, get uh, remind uh, staff, I think we said we would get uh, a specific written listing of the specific job uh, titles that were furloughed. Um, Regina did give us a, a great a verbal rundown, but I think we said we would be getting a, a written copy of that, the specific job titles. Oh, that were furloughed, so I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else anybody wants to flag? All right. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Manager, Ms. Johnson, I believe we're at the end of our agenda. Is there any, either, either of you all have any comments to add on I'll then ask if my colleagues have anything to add as well. Mr. Manager, do you all have anything? Uh, no, other than to say that we'll be back at it tomorrow morning at uh, at 10 o'clock. Uh, we had a very productive day, I think, and we've got a lot of uh, uh, other departments that have important issues to uh, present and discuss tomorrow. So we will uh, you know, block the time up till 2 o'clock, uh, but hopefully, as we've been efficient today, uh, move through the process and uh, and be you know be able to conclude in a reasonable time. But that's all I have right now. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Just a reminder that the presentations and other budget documents are on our website, and that you will receive a separate and different link for tomorrow's meeting tomorrow morning. And then also some additional information I think is still forthcoming from a couple of departments, right, Bertha? There's one presentation to still come, the engagement presentation, which we will get, we will send out today. Thank you very much. And just Colleagues, one, any final comments? Just one additional um, ad, ask. The way that the transportation department had their breakdown of staff, that would be actually helpful to see for Parks and Rec, because it's not just who was furloughed, it's actually who was who was kept, so who actually continued on working, like what that looked like, that would be helpful. I think you mean, I think you mean the uh, chart, the uh, staff chart. Yes, the staff, the org chart. Yeah, the org chart. 
Yeah, it's a little, a little more complex in Parks and Recreation just because the number of positions, but we'll try to think of a way to describe that. Even if it's just paired with the one we had last year, with yeah. like three just separate documents of what we had last year, what we have this year, and then just those numbers that Middleton, Council Member Middleton mentioned. That's yeah, it would be the part-time piece would be hard because the part-time positions wouldn't show up on an org chart, but we can figure out a way to get that information to you in a different way. All right. Yes, thank you. Anyone else, final comments? Council Member Caballero. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of our staff. There's been a couple of times, everybody's presentations were excellent. You know, just reflecting on that, we had three people today who are either interim or new hire directors and the challenges that they faced these last few months and just how much appreciation I have for them. And then just uh, two times while I was listening to the presentation, first was during the general services presentation, thinking through all of our custodial services and how over the years so many organizations have uh, contracted out that labor so those folks aren't making living wages and we know that many of the folks who provide those services are, are black and brown and so these are folks who have living wages are continuing to be employed and this that depreciation of having that value and not having done that uh, and then additionally knowing that so many of our staff and it was actually uh, Sean's kids screaming in the background, a reminder that so many of us have a lot of stuff going on in the background. And so again, so much appreciation for our staff, knowing that the last couple of months, many of you have been home with um, kids, uh, with potential elderly parents that you're having to worry about. And so um, we have several hard months ahead of us and I am constantly reminded about the, the stress that all of us are dealing with right now. Thank you so much. Council Member Reese. Um, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to thank everybody for participating and all the good questions and thank staff um, from the city manager uh, to Bertha on down for making today really productive. I look forward to another productive day tomorrow. Did want to note before we got off the phone, um, about three weeks ago, uh, the James Beard Foundation announced nominations for their various awards having to do with uh, food and um, and the culinary arts. One of those categories is the James Beard Award in Journalism, and one of the nominees was uh, local uh, historian and writer, Dr. Cynthia Greenlee. And this morning, while we were on our uh, Zoom call, she won the James Beard Award uh, for journalism in her area. I just wanted to congratulate her and uh, just another feather in Durham's cap. She is uh, uh, the I thought some of you might be interested in the piece that she wrote that uh, garnered her this James Beard Award is in vice.com published uh, in February of 2019. The title is A Real Hot Mess, How Grits Got Weaponized Against Cheating Men. <clears throat> so as soon as we get off the phone here, I'll definitely be uh, tucking into that particular article and maybe enjoying some tasty grits along with it. So anyway, Dr. Greenlee, congratulations. Uh, Well-deserved award. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And, and I will say she's an alumna of the Independent. So mm. we're proud. Uh, any other comments? Any final comments? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, sir. Uh, Charlie, I recommend you listen to Al Green while you're reading that uh, article. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to say um, just the overwhelming sense of, of gratitude I have uh, for the staff, but also to be in the position uh, that I am uh, personally. I um, And I say that because I recognize that as I sit here uh, with this distinguished, distinguished group making decisions, um, at the highest level of leadership in our city, um, that there are still uh, some things that, that I'm not insulated from, notwithstanding uh, my position or, or station. Uh, today, I want to send out um, solidarity and condolences to the family of George Floyd um, today, who died at the hands of the Minneapolis Police Department. I also want to send um, good regards out to Mayor Frey Minneapolis and, and to our colleagues on the uh, Minneapolis City Council, many of whom uh, I've had the opportunity of meeting uh, through my work with the National League uh, of Cities. Um, I think that's all I want to say. I, I just wanted to call his name uh, uh, in this context and on record uh, and signal that we understand uh, that here in Durham, how blessed we are. I want to uh, express gratitude for uh, the type of leadership we have here in Durham, uh, particularly I want to shout out Chief Sarah Lynn Davis and her command staff, um, our fire uh, first responders all across the board and for the hard work they do uh, to, to properly convey 
what we will have and what we will not have in Durham uh, and the standards that are important to us. Um, I do not know what the future holds. If, if one day we'll wake up in Durham and we'll be facing um, challenges that some other cities have uh, faced, but I would not want to face those challenges with any different type of leadership than we have um, at our department heads. And I would add that to this council as well. So I just want to uh, say to the Floyd family, our prayers uh, are with them uh, for all of the countless victims who did not have the benefit of cameras present. Um, we're with them as well. And we continue to do the hard work of making this uh, a more perfect union. At least that's what's in the pamphlet. Um, so God bless uh, the people of Minneapolis. God bless the Floyd family. Uh, God bless our city. Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for those important words, council member. And I think the words I can't breathe are gonna continue to resonate through generations. Any final comments, anyone else? Councilmember Freeman. Thank you. I wanted to echo uh, Councilmember Middleton's comments around uh, just acknowledging just how hard times are right now and Councilmember Caballeros as well. And noting that I want, I want to make sure that I say it out loud, that it's important to breathe. It's important to actually take stock of where you are and how things are going. Um, I realize that a lot of people have also um, lost loved ones in this time. And we've really been hit hard here in Durham. I know with the loss of, you know, Andrea Harris, Marianne Black, Brother Ray, and how that shakeup has created uh, gaps in our community um, that will need to be filled is important. and. Even with with staff, just noting, you know, being at home and dealing with the challenges, it's 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 important to make sure that you're aware and present where you are and how you are and and who you are. Because I mean, there's no we're all human beings in this, and I think um, I often feel like I need to say that because I've spent so much time addressing the race equity aspect of these conversations because it's often the underserved, the marginalized, the voices that are unheard. And it, 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 it tends to make me feel like I'm overcompensating. And so I just wanna make sure that I note that it's not just that, it's that we are human beings. We're all in this together and we're going to get through it, but it's not gonna be doing things the way things were done before. So when people say the new normal, it, it needs to be something new and better. And I'm looking forward to that. So on that note, I'll leave that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to take another moment to thank our staff for all their work on the budget and through this um, difficult moment, I noted as um, Council Member Caballero did that all three directors are new to their positions, only one new to the city, but um, or have stepped into additional leadership roles um, very either during or very shortly before, um, very shortly before the pandemic. And so I um, just wanted to appreciate them for the work that they're doing in this difficult time for the city. Uh, a lot of institutions are really struggling right now, and I continue to be impressed by the leadership that we have here in Durham and the way that our staff um, are navigating this crisis. Uh, we are, you know, it, it's it's a difficult moment, but I feel like we're in very good hands here in Durham, and so I just wanted to express that and thank you all again for your for your leadership and your work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think we have wrapped it up, Mr. Manager. Uh, I'll, uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, we have, I guess, uh, one more presentation coming tonight that we haven't gotten yet, the engagement one. Um, and uh, we're, we're all looking forward to being together again tomorrow. I wanna thank staff. We miss your smiling faces. We, 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 we always enjoy these times when we have our our budget staff around us and we get to see you all in person and the good work that you do and i'm sorry we can't do that this year but i feel assured that next year we will be back together together in person uh and uh we just want to appreciate you so thank you and i'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 1 p.m
Bye, everybody. Thank Have you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.